Towing and Storage Advisory Board meeting to order. Today is November 16th, and we welcome everybody that traveled to be here and all those listening on the internet. First item is call to order. <coughs> Joanne Messina is present. Jeremy Clark. Present. Thomas Griffin. Present. Kyle Jackson. Present. Amy Milstead. Present. Tasha Mora. Present. Jeanette Rash. Here. James Spears. Present. Jimmy Zulke. Present. Did I say that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Very good. We have a quorum. We have a full board here for the first time in a long time. <laughs> we have five new members, and I'm so excited. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we look forward to working with you. Um, why don't we take a minute for the new folks and just, um, we'll start with you, Kyle. Just say your name and, and who you represent. Uh, good morning. My name is Kyle Jackson. Uh, I'm with the Texas Apartment Association. Uh, we represent about 11,000 members and 2 million apartment units across the state of Texas. So um, here is the parking facility owner's representative. Tasha? Hi, I'm Tasha Mora, and I am the towing and VSF representative on the board. I am from Austin, Texas with A&A Wrecker and Recovery. We are a towing and vehicle storage facility. We provide uh, non-consent services, private property, incident management, consent, and motor club, and just all inclusive. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thomas? My name is Thomas Griffin. I'm a, a, a sergeant with the Houston Police Department where I've been for 26 years. I am currently in the auto dealer's detail, uh, which is the small part of the police department that oversees the towing and storage and automotive industries. Good. Jeremy? My name is Jeremy Clark. I'm from Mason, Texas, and we represent the uh, VSF storage facility of under a million. We have a county population of just over 4,000 in our county. We're a mom and pop shop. When you talk about the little guy, it doesn't get much smaller than us. My name is Jimmy Zelke. I retired from the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission after 25 years of service. I reached the rank of lieutenant. I retired. Now I, uh, I did work for the Hayes County Sheriff's Office for four years. Uh, now I work for the Hayes County Precinct 4 in Dripping Springs as a deputy constable. And I look forward to serving on the board. Good. Thank you, everyone. And I do want to um, take a minute to recognize Hector Cabello, who rolled off the board last, his last meeting was his last meeting, and thank him for his many years of service. Hector was with us from the beginning, and he was one of our towing and storage representatives, so um, I want to just recognize his time with us and his work. And uh, I know you're not listening, Hector, but we miss you. And then I want to take a minute to... Um, a moment to think about George Ferry. Uh, George was director of compliance for TDLR. He passed away unexpectedly last month, and uh, just want to take a minute to remember him. And our next item is training for our new board members. We're going to do some uh, Public Information Act training. So good morning. My name is Elizabeth Salinas Stridmatter. I am the Assistant General Counsel who um, assists this program. And this morning I'm going to be giving some very high-level review of several of the acts that affect you as a board. Now I know uh, a lot of you attended the advisory summit that was last week and you got some very in-depth training from three of my colleagues. Um, this is designed to supplement that and to be a refresher for our um, board members who have been on the board for a while and haven't received this training yet. Um, but so you will see there are some materials for you um, on your iPads and you can also follow along. And the reason I'm standing up is I don't actually like to do presentations sitting down, so I apologize for that. But uh, I'm going to be up here. But you can look at up here at this board or you can look at your iPads. Your iPads don't have 
my exact presentation, but they have materials that the GC's office has put together that encapsulates the information I'm going to be sharing with you today. So today, we're going to be talking about the Open Meetings Act, the Administrative Procedures Act, and the Public Information Act. These are all three acts which affect you directly as board members and which, in a sense, regulate what you can and can't do with regards to open government and public records and things like that. So let's first talk about the Open Meetings Act. So the Open Meetings Act, as you guys know, is an act that basically allows for us to have open and transparent government. We always want the public to know what we are doing at all times, and we want to always appear to be above board in anything we discuss or anything we do that is subject to the Open Meetings Act. Um, there's the citation for the law if you're so inclined to go to go actually read it, but it's found in the Texas Government Code in Chapter 551. So if anybody's listening at home, that's where you can go actually read the text um, of the Open Meetings Act. So a meeting that is held by a, a government agency or its representatives must adhere to the Open Meetings Act and must, um, must meet certain requirements. And the first requirement is a notice requirement. So as it applies to us and as it applies to any state agency, we must give the, the TDLR and the advisory board of the committee must give the written notice of date, hour, place, and subject of each meeting that's held. Um, and those are the agendas that you see Tamala circulate to you guys um, about seven days. Um, it, but it must be done at least seven days prior to each meeting. You can get them before that, but it has to be at least seven days before each meeting that the public needs to be aware of when, when you're going to meet and what you're going to be discussing. Um, it also must be posted on the Secretary of State website on the internet. Um, and we, TDLR, post it as well on our own uh, website. In addition to those notice requirements, you also have quorum requirements. Joanne mentioned a few minutes ago that this is the first time in a very long time that we have the full board sitting before us. Um, in order to actually have a meeting, we have to meet the quorum. And the quorum for you all would be six out of your nine members. Um, in order to, to take any official action, you must have a quorum present. Now, you can actually meet in a meeting if for some reason you get into a meeting and you thought that you were going to have a quorum, but you actually fall short. You could continue with that meeting, but you can't take any official action. Um, sometimes if boards see that situation coming, they'll cancel their meeting, or some of them might want to go ahead and actually have the meeting, but there's no power behind that meeting. You can't take any official votes or conduct any official business if you are short on your quorum. Um, so this, this kind of discuss what I, what I just said is that in order for you guys to take a vote, for example, on rules and whether to publish those rules, adopt those rules, or send them on to the commission. If we did not have a quorum here today, that's one of the items that's on our agenda, we could not um, move forward on decision making with regards to those rules. So it's very, very important that if for some reason you cannot meet this meeting, you cannot come to any scheduled board meeting, that you communicate with our uh, staff with Tamala to let her know or with Joanne to let her know because there may be a decision that needs to be made of whether to push off the meeting if in fact we find that we're going to fall short of any given of a quorum at any given time. Um, so the question that we get a lot are well what if I'm at a party and there is a quorum of board members present. So the answer to that question is if you are present with a quorum at a social function you can talk about matters that are unrelated to public business. <coughs> and that social gathering would not be subject to the Mo Open Meetings Act. But if you begin to exchange in a social setting about information relating to official business or information over which your board has supervision or control, you are going to be subject to the Open Meetings Act. So. The takeaway from that is you do not have to be sitting in this room to be subject to the Open Meetings Act. You have to be very careful anytime you're out and about and there are a quorum of you present because there may be an instance where you're having a conversation and it seems to be just fine and then all of a sudden you veer off into a subject that you have control over or for which official business is pending. Once you veer off into those subjects, you are going to be subject to the Open Meetings Act and that would be problematic. So uh, we'll talk about best practice tips here in a minute of how to avoid these situations. Um, we talked about that. Uh, well, we'll <coughs> talk about this. 
if you're talking about something that's incidental to the board meeting and you have a quorum of people, um, that is not engaging in a, for, in a formal meeting. Um, what about con conventions, conferences, and workshops? Pretty much the same thing as a social situation. If you are talking about public business or public policy that's incidental to the event and no formal action is being taken, then you're not subject to the Open Meetings Act. If these two things aren't true, then you are going to be subject to the Open Meetings Act and you'll want to be very careful about those conversations. So the key point to remember is just be aware of the situation that you're in. When you are in situations where a quorum is present, outside of the confines of this room and outside of the confines of a properly noticed meeting of the board. Um, do not engage in substantive conversations relating to board or committee business or policy when a quorum is present that is best practice policy and you are outside of an officially noticed meeting or a scheduled meeting. So that sounds all good and fine but there's something called the walking quorum that you also have to be very very careful about and walking quorums occur when less than a quorum of a board or a committee discuss official business through any means. And this is becoming very important because we live in a highly technologically advanced society and communication is no longer just face to face or on the phone. We have many, many ways that we communicate now. So walking quorums can, can arise in any given situation. And, and so the elements that you need to have is less than a quorum of, of the board is discussing official business through any means and then one or more people who were present during that conversation communicate those discussions to other board members who were not present. So when less than a quorum participates in the initial communication and there's subsequent communication with other members, you are going to be engaged in a quorum that is outside of a public meeting. Okay, so I want to make sure everybody, everybody understands what we're talking about, so here's an example. <coughs> On a five-member advisory board, two board members exchange phone calls and emails, expressing thoughts on an upcoming rules change and exchanging research that they have each individually done on a given issue. One of the board members on a five board member panel forwards that exchange, the email exchange and or notes about their conversation to a third board member. He has just created a walking quorum on a five board member outside of an officially noticed meeting. So he falls outside of the Open Meetings Act um, by exchanging this information. And I believe Wendy talked about this during the advisory board summit, or one of the other AGCs did. These are the things you have to be very careful of <coughs> because they can occur during conference calls, video conferences, hallway discussions right out here during breaks, um, emails, text messages, and other new technologies like social media. So social media, I think, probably is the one that everybody needs to be super hyper vigilant about because when you're on Twitter or you're on Facebook or you're on Snapchat or whatever it is that you're on and you send out information relating to a conversation that you've had or even a thought that you have about official business, you potentially have reached every single board member who sits on the board with you. And so you are, and then if there are conversations that occur, you are creating a walking quorum because you are potentially reaching this audience. You don't know who you're reaching. So be very careful on Facebook and Twitter and all of the other social media platforms that you are not inadvertently creating a quorum with statements that you're making on social media. So the best practices to avoid even the appearance of um, having a walk-in quorum are to not meet in small groups, discuss board or committee business, and then communicate those discussions to other members, send emails or text messages to a quorum regarding official business even if you're sending individual emails rather than group emails. Sometimes people think, well, I'm not creating a walk-in quorum because I didn't CC the entire board or I didn't CC the number of members that would make it necessary for us to establish a quorum. This is a problem. Even if you are individually sending messages to each person, you are still potentially creating a walking <coughs> quorum. So our best practice tips are just not to do this. Um, don't ask quorum members, uh, even on an individual basis, individual basis for feedback or comments on advisory board or committee business outside of a publicly noticed meeting. 
That's called polling. So say, for example, uh, Joanne goes up to Kyle and a couple other members and wants to have a conversation to see what their thoughts are about issue, uh, an issue over which the board has authority uh, and power. She's probably engaging in polling even if you aren't actually conducting any official business or looking to see whether there are votes. She may be accidentally asking whether somebody supports this and you can fall into the trap of polling. So just be very careful with your conversations outside of the confines of a properly noticed meeting. So open sessions. What do we need to do to have properly, proper open sessions under the Act? You are limited to discussing the specific items that are on the agenda. So the agendas are what you all receive from Tamala um, shortly before the meetings. Uh, and that will have a list of all of the things that we're going to talk about during the meeting. You are limited to those specific items. So if you have something that you want to place on an item on the agenda and it's not on that agenda, you probably have to wait until another meeting to get it onto that particular agenda. Okay? Um, during the public comment period, which we'll have in a few minutes, you can definitely listen to the public and anybody who chooses to speak, um, but we are not allowed, you are not allowed as a board, um, to actually engage in discussions about that unless it is on the agenda and then you would have to discuss it on the properly, on the, on the, during the meeting in the proper place on the agenda. Um, so sometimes it gets real frustrating for board members that you can't engage in a back and forth with a public commenter, um, but that is a restriction um, that you just accept and listen to the comments and then at a later date, if somebody wants to propose to put that subject on the agenda, you certainly can. Um, as a board, you can set reasonable time limits. Uh, and I think <coughs> we do have time limits here. I'm not sure if it's two or three minutes. Um, but you all can decide what is appropriate and set those reasonable time limits for public comment. Um, a member of the public or a member of the board can raise a subject that is not on the agenda. So you have your agenda in front of you today. One of our lovely members of the public may come up and make a comment about something that is not on the agenda. They are more than welcome to do that. Um, but again, your meeting is going to be limited um, to what is on our actual agenda. So sometimes that's a little bit hard. I know that you want to engage with the public and the public wants to engage with you. But if it is not on our agenda, that engagement is extremely limited and we have to be very careful of that. So your best practices are always to specifically identify items to TDLR staff that you want to be placed on the agenda to make sure that we have them on the agenda so you can talk about them in your meetings. Uh, limit your discussion to the specific agenda items that are posted on the Secretary of State website that are filed and posted, that are posted, as I said, on the TDLR website and posted on the Secretary of State website. Um, and avoid letting discussions sort of wander off into things uh, that may not have been noticed to the public. Uh, and again, can be very frustrating. We're not saying you can't ever have those subjects on the agenda. They can be placed on the agenda, but they have to be placed on the agenda at a later date. Um, and as I said, there's, there's really no ability to respond to the public if the issue that they're bringing up is not on the agenda. Your response must come later if you decide to place it on the agenda. Um, so, what happens if we violate the Open Meetings Act? This is very important. So any interested person, including the media, can petition the courts to stop any actions taken in violation of the Open Meetings Act. Okay, so uh, it also states that an action taken in violation of the meeting is voidable. So if you as a board do something that it's in violation of the Open Meetings Act, um, it can not only be voided, but somebody can file a lawsuit to prevent you from actually taking whatever official action you may have voted to take. Uh, so again, best practices is just try to be aware of these situations and to avoid them at all costs so that we don't get into that. There are also criminal penalties, uh, misdemeanor criminal penalties, and there are fines, uh, $100 to $500 or confinement in county jail, or both fines and confinement. Um, so as you can see, the state of Texas takes uh, the violation of the Open Meetings Act very seriously. Um, so here are your resources in case you have a lot of time and want to go read those. You can go ahead and look at those. Um, but also I am available if you ever have any questions about the Open Meetings Act or any of the acts that I'm going to present here today. 
So the Administrative Procedures Act. The Administrative Procedures Act basically Elizabeth, establishes. Can I ask yes. one thing? Um, before you continue, you said that six would be a quorum for our nine, and I think it's five. I'm it's, sorry. Okay, I just yeah, want to clarify I misspoke. that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Everything she said about quorum means yes. five of us. It's five. Yes. Thank Excuse you. me. Thank you for for um, <coughs> clarifying that for me. Um, s does anybody else have any questions on the Open Meetings Act before we continue? <coughs> okay. So the Administrative Procedures Act. The Administrative Procedures Act is also applicable to all state government agencies, and it basically provides a uniform way for the agencies to operate. Um, and again, this act, just like the Open Meetings Act, is designed to ensure that the public can see everything that we're doing at all times um, and not have any question about why something is occurring. The APA allows us to do rules, and rules are one of the big things that we're going to talk about here at the meeting today. So this is the vehicle that allows state agencies to create rules that set out um, implements, interprets, or prescribes law or policy, or describes the procedure or practice requirements of a state agency. So you all are aware that the towing industry and VSF industry have rules. There are statutes which have the force of law, and there are rules that prescribe those statutes. And you will see in, in the statutes that give us, give you all authority, uh, the department has very broad rulemaking authority to create rules, and then there are some instances, which we'll talk about here today, where statutes will specifically say, TDLR, this is what we're changing the law to, you need to go make rules. And so we'll talk about some of those things today. But the, the APA is what gives um, everyone the authority to, to define these rules. When you're looking at rules, you always have to include amendments or repeals of prior rules, if any. So when you look at those rules online, you'll see that next to those rules in parentheses, there's a lot of small italics writing with dates and all of that. That's just telling you that something happened to the rule during a specific time and what happened to it. So you can always go back and reference what the previous rule said if you have any questions about whether a rule said something in the past or whether a rule ever said something. Um, and the rules, very important don't just relate to the internal operation of any state agency, including TDLR. They are basically the rules that operate to regulate your industries. So the rules are what we look to to tell us what you can and you can't do or what you must or shall do. Um, any interested person, quote unquote, can petition for the adoption of the rule, and this initiates a rulemaking process. An interested person is anyone in the, in the state of Texas, a Texas resident any business located in Texas, any state governmental subdivision like your advisory board, and a public or private organization that is not a state agency but that is located in the state of Texas. This is the process that we go through and this just kind of breaks it down. Um, for those of you who are not aware of the rulemaking process, it is a very intensive, very um, date specific and date driven process. So where we start here is we have an idea for the rule. And then what happens is we draft rules internally to send them to the advisory board. And then the advisory board will have a conversation, as we did last um, advisory board meeting, about those rules. And the board may decide, OK, we're going to go ahead and give you authority to file those rules with the Texas Register. If you feel that those rules are ready to be published, you will give us, TDLR, the authority to go and do that. We will publish them, and then the public has 30 days to comment on the rules, and then we will come back. I will review the comments on the rules, and so will other GCs within our office and other attorneys. Um, we'll look to see whether there need to be any changes recommended to the rules. You as the board will then review the comments and decide, do we want to go ahead and recommend these rules be taken to, for adoption by the full commission? Um, then the commission will review the rules. There will be a pr presentation at a board meeting. Um, and then if the adoption, if the commission adopts, they'll be filed with the Texas Register. And very important, the rules don't become effective when the commission adopts and we file. There's a 20-day waiting period after filing for those rules to become effective. So in that interim period between publication and the 20 days, the rules as they exist on the date of publication remain, and then 20 days after, the new rules come into effect. 
Um, there's also a rule review process, which in some programs happens every four years. Um, this is the process that that goes through. We file a notice of intent to review the rules, all of the rules, not just one or two, all of the rules. The public has 30 days to comment on any of the rules that are there. Again, GC reviews them, makes a recommendation to the commission, the commission reviews, and, and will decide whether it wants to readopt the, ru the, the rules. And the advisory board will be presented with any comments and may recommend changes on those reviews, on those types of reviews. So again, here are your resources for rulemaking in case you have any questions. And again, feel free to call or email me and I'm happy to answer those questions as well. Um, the last act we're going to talk about is the Public Information Act. And the Public Information Act is a re really long, I'm going to condense this down, basically says that what we talk about as a government agency, with some exceptions, is open to the public and the public can file for an open, uh, open records request and can receive certain information or can receive most information with some exceptions. Okay, so what this means is that any electronic communication, that it includes any document, any electronic communication created, transmitted, received, or maintained, including emails, on any device if it is con in connection with official business, and this becomes very, very important, text messages are subject to the act. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of law. This is kind of a, a, an interesting area of law um, where you're getting a lot of court decisions related to text messages and whether the text message occurred on a government issued device or whether it occurred on a personal device and if it occurred on a personal device is it still subject to the act. I'm going to tell you that my recommendation is always going to be be careful about any communications that you were having over any form of electronics or in writing because you should always assume that those may be subject to the Open Records Act if they don't fall under some of the narrow exceptions. So just be cognizant of the fact that text messages are included in that. So what happens when we received an open records request? So somebody from the public, and it can be anybody, uh, sends an open records re request and they should be sending them to um, our open records folks. But sometimes people will not understand the process and they may send one to you. They may send something that says, please provide all information related to X, Y, and Z. And you're looking at that going, I think this might be an open records request. So what you need to do is you need to immediately forward it to me so that I can get it to our open records folks. And, because, and the reason why you have to do it immediately is because by law, we have to we have to give a prompt response approximately 10 days after it comes into the office. We need to have provided some sort of response. And always remember, you can't send an email or call the person and say, tell me why you want these records again. <coughs> we just have to provide the records and we can't look behind the reasons for them requesting. Um, this is particularly important because you'll get media requests. Um, you may get constituent requests for open records. Just remember, don't ask the reason why they want them. Just forward their request on to me so I can get it to our open records folks. So there are some exemptions to disclosure that I talked about um, and that I think you guys talked about in depth with our open records um, GC, uh, Nick Lalos. But here are sort of the, the most common ones that are required to be redacted from open records. Dates of birth, email, um, Certain education documents are subject to FERPA, that's the federal law, uh, and HIPAA information and Texas Medical Records Privacy Act. So you all, for your purposes, if you were to get an open records request, you don't need to worry about, oh my gosh, what gets redacted, what doesn't get redacted. Just send it on to us and we, our experts in, in the in TDLR will figure all of that information out. But the important thing to do is to not <coughs> sit on a request and to always remind people, well, if you want information related to that, file an open records request with TDLR and there are instructions on our website for how to do that. Okay, here are your resources for that. Um, and do you all have any questions, comments, or concerns that I can address right now? Okay, all right, well thank you for your attention and again, feel free to call me or email me. My, you should have my address, um, but I will give you a business card, each of you, if I haven't already. <coughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, the next item on our agenda is the approval of the minutes from our last meeting on September 22nd. Did everybody have a chance to look at these? Do we have any corrections or motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Amy Milstead. 
We have a second. I second Jeanette Rash. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Minutes are approved as <coughs> presented. Now, do we have any public comment forms? No public comment? Everybody's quiet today, huh? All righty. <laughs> We're ready for staff reports. Executive Office, Nick. Thank you, Madam Chair and board members, and, and welcome everybody, especially new board members. Glad to have you on board. Welcome to TDLR. Uh, I'm Nick Voynis of TDLR, uh, here to bring an executive office report, kind of a summary of what's going on around the agency. Uh, it's been a busy year. As, uh, as you all know, with the legislature in town, it started off in January uh, with the 85th legislative session. Then we had a special summer session this year. Uh, TDLR has been busy here late uh, implementing some of the bills that were passed into law. Uh, so we've had all, all of our divisions have been involved in the process, which includes developing rules, communicating to stakeholders. Uh, appointing and prepping advisory boards, uh, hiring additional staff, and dealing with education exams, IT programs, and more. Uh, to remind you, on May 29th, Governor Abbott signed House Bill 100, which uh, immediately brought oversight of the state's transportation network companies to TDLR. Uh, we've had some other new programs come on board. On September 1, TDLR picked up the state's podiatrist. And just recently, on November 1st, we added uh, six more health-related programs from the Department of State, State Health Services. Uh, phase two of the 13 total programs that were granted to us uh, two years ago. So we now have code enforcement officers, laser hair removal, massage therapy, mold assessors and remediators, offender education programs, and sanitarians. And on September 1 of next year, we'll pick up the state's behavioral analysts. I uh, wanted to also mention that as we add programs granted to us by the legislature, uh, lawmakers have also deregulated five of our former programs since, tw since 2003, uh, and they will de deregulate another four in the next two years. So we recommended that action after our strategic planning process, which we will also go through again here this spring, and uh, also included uh, public and industry feedback. The uh, legislature then agreed with us and um, uh, agreed that the licensing requirement for these programs were unnecessary and burdensome and doing without them posed little or no risk to consumer protection. Uh, last, meet, last meeting we talked a bit about our uh, uh, TDLR's response plan and actions uh, for uh, Hurricane Harvey relief over the last uh, few months. TDLR staff has been working hard to help our licensees and small businesses. Uh, in the Gulf Coast area recover from devastation of Hurricane Harvey. Uh, in coordination with the governor's office and the, their Rebuild Texas efforts, we've been implementing procedures to assist all eligible licensees in the affected areas to help them recover, return to work as quickly as possible by removing the burden of red tape. Our Harvey focus now is on the rebuild by protecting uh, small business and uh, consumers avoid unlicensed activity and ensuring that they receive quality work for their hard-earned dollars. Uh, you can find more information on this on our website at tdlr.texas.gov as well as the uh, uh, Governor's Rebuild Texas site. Uh, in addition to our web presence, I also wanted to remind you, uh, if you're on social media, to check our Facebook and Twitter accounts and join us there to keep up with uh, various TDLR activities and events. But wanted to get back to the website for a minute and give you an update on, uh, on some web traffic for the program here uh, for our towing page. Uh, since January 1, uh, the last 10 months, the vehicle storage website has had 278,728 page views. So it's been quite busy. It's an average of uh, 920 page views a day. And uh, your visitors are definitely on the go. Uh, only 39% of those visitors accessed your site from a desktop computer, while 61% did so from a mobile device, 57% uh, from a smartphone, and 4% from a tablet. And the top reasons for visiting your site, uh, number one is laws and rules, followed by online licensing, consumer information, applications and forms, and FAQs. 
there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Otherwise, thank you very much. Uh, do we know uh, the the user satisfaction levels? Uh, did they get on the site, get what they wanted, and they were pleased with it? Or yes, did sir. you get any feedback that they needed to be glad to provide you some additional information on that. Uh, thank you. Sure. Especially with, with that number of people using it, we really want to make sure that, that they're getting what they want. Absolutely. We monitor that regularly. Anybody else? Thank you, Nick. That's astounding. 900 a day. Of course, half of those are probably me, but <laughs> I know I'm on there a lot. <laughs> but I usually We're find what I need. <laughs> okay. Um, the next item is Compliance Division. Todd? Good morning. My name is Todd Forrester. I'm with the Compliance Division, TDLR. We have been working hard to continue to provide education opportunities for towing and VSF employees. This in October, October 27th, we conducted a VSF compliance workshop in Georgetown. We covered the compliance manual. Uh, had about 30 people there. Uh, went over any questions they had and uh, went over the compliance manual. To, for, for all the laws and rules for VSFs. We are also working on reviewing the towing and VSF laws and rules, or rules, to review and consider feedback from the industry uh, that, that we receive for the training classes through contacts with the industry via phone, emails, as well as external and internal strategic planning sessions. Anything, anytime somebody sees something that could be done a little better, just let us know and we'll definitely take it into account. Latasha? Good morning. My name is Latasha Fuller, and I'm also with the Compliance Division. Um, as Ty reported, we've been uh, conducting the VSF and VSF trainings with the industry. We've also just been working with General Counsel on the rules and just making sure that all correct information is going out to every customer um, as needed. That's all I have. Do you have any questions? I just want to thank you once again for the, doing this compliance training. It's so valuable to keep people in compliance with our complicated statutes and rules that it's, it's awesome. We just really appreciate it. And I am looking at a way to hopefully maybe see if we can get it online or something. It's just a lot of information. Uh, the trainings last around six hours whenever we, we have them. Um, and it would be a little tougher too because I, I like the feedback from the industry. The, feedbacks, the the best part of it. Right. Because it, things change. Absolutely. It's never the same, and that's part of the problem. Absolutely. I think the one on one also helps Todd and Latasha with them being able to ask questions when they're there. That's been very valuable to our people. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, you know, part of it is we could put the information online, you know, in a recorded version somehow, but I don't know if it would have the impact. But, uh, you know, you also got to look at the people in remote areas. I mean, you know, how could they get it? So we're thinking about everything we can would be good to have it online or even do maybe try to schedule some webinars where mm -hmm. people could give feedback online from remote areas right uh, we'll definitely try look at, that look at all options the last advisory board meeting we were asked to look at vehicles that are stored but they're registered in another country the the laws and rules do not they don't they, there are two types of vehicles registered in Texas and not registered in Texas whether it's another state or another country, you treat it the same. If the vehicle's registered, not registered in Texas, go through the same process, even if it's a different country. Any questions on that? So would that mean that Invitas has a way of doing that research? Well, in Invitas is if you can't determine the, uh, place, of or the place of registration. So if, if you know it's registered in another country, you just follow the exact same steps. I assume if you ran an Invitas report and it wasn't from this country, you'd come back nothing. That way you just treat it, you publish it, treat it just like you would a vehicle where you can't obtain that information. Knock on wood, I right. haven't had one of those yet. <laughs> Anybody else on that issue? Madam Chair, I have a question. <clears throat> Todd, do you know when the emergency uh, permits issued expire? I've been asked that question. Be a great question for Laura Hernandez. Just, okay. 
Maybe we should get address that when she's yeah. Okay. Okay. She's with license. It should be better to okay, address it than is. us. Okay, cool. Anything else for compliance? You could do that class on Facebook Live and people can send their <laughs> questions. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, okay. you guys should be following and they could just send their questions to you while you're doing it. It's a good idea, but I, I feel like it would get overwhelming. It would, you know. Sections like part right. one, part two, part three. And we, I mean, it might overwhelm Facebook with how many likes we get. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate you guys. Okay, next up is education and examination. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, board members. My name is Lady Grantham. I'm with the Education and Examination Division. Thank you for being here today. Uh, before you are the reports on CE statistics showing the approved providers and the courses available that we have on our website. And that's all I've got today. Short and sweet. Is there any <laughs> questions that you may any have? Any questions on the education statistics? Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Next up. Enforcement Division. Good morning, Madam Chairman, members of the board. A special welcome to the new members. It's great to have you here. It's a very important function of TDLR. My name is Michael Shirk. I'm one of the prosecutors in the Enforcement Division, and I'm going to cover some of the enforcement statistics. You have a, a description of just a <coughs> random sampling of cases from October, and I would just suggest that the most important number there is the number of agreed orders that we're issuing these days. Enforcement is looking very much to make compliance a priority. We'd so much rather um, work with people who are in violation to bring about compliance rather than prosecute uh, because then those cases don't show up on our desk again. And so I think out of these six cases, four of them are agreed orders. They speak for themselves. The, the um, violations are pretty standard. We have an agreed order for $1,500 for the failure to have required information on notification letters. We do have one default order, which is what is issued when enforcement sends out a notice of alleged violations to a respondent, to a license holder, a BSF, or a towing company. They don't respond to us. We give them a second notice about what the violations are, what the proposed penalty is. If they still don't respond, the executive director is authorized by law to issue an, um, a default order, which imposes a penalty. And so that's what it means here when it says default order. Um, the three other three remaining cases are agreed orders. The penalties are relatively low. You can see they're at one half of what would otherwise be permitted by our enforcement plan, but that's because we gained compliance and we're able to come in with a low penalty, um, which is required by our, our enforcement plan, sets the amount of penalties that we charge for a specific violation. Uh, the last one, however, was a $1,200 violation for failure to have proper fencing around the vehicle storage facility. That was a full $1,200, but that was a second violation. That's why you see the higher penalty. We, we have higher penalties based on recidivist status. The key statistics on the next page, I think, are also um, different than what we've seen in the past. We are, in fact, closing more cases than c are coming in, which is great. One reason for that, again, is because of our emphasis on compliance rather than prosecution. It allows us to move the cases. We're getting a somewhat of a switch in staffing on the tow VSF cases, um, and so the backlog is beginning to develop a little bit again, but I think that we're going to be moving, uh, again, moving out of the negative numbers into the positive numbers. It's the same sort of decrease if you look at the penalty sums, both in real numbers and as a percentage of the violations that go out, seeing a decrease in the amount of penalties that are being assessed. The um, Again, this is, this is because we really collect the money as a way of general and specific deterrence. And what I mean by that is to show the industry that you should comply with the law. If you don't, there will be penalties. You know, one of the themes of enforcement is that compliance with the law should be less expensive than violating the law. And that's, that frames our activities. The, um, the final set of statistics <coughs> are the top ten violations we see. I will note that on a couple of these, for instance, the data plates on the tow trucks and the uh, drug policy, those are no longer direct to enforcement. So that if an inspector doing a routine periodic inspection finds one of those violations, generally we're going to work with them and seek uh, compliance again, you know, enroll in a, in a drug program through the consortium or some other means, um, get the manufacturer data sheet and put that in the truck. 
so that we, these numbers for those two violations um, are just what was in the pipeline that has been cleared up. Again, we're really focusing on the unlicensed activities, the uh, failure to tow in a safe and competent manner, and charging more than what's permitted by tow uh, by the tow laws. Usually, those overcharges we're finding those only in the municipalities that have um, fee caps on what can be charged for tow. Then the final page are the same. VSF statistics about uh, what are the top 10 violations. I know it's interesting to see what those are. So this has been a good quarter for the enforcement division. We're moving our cases more quickly. The more regular sort of cases, we really are trying <coughs> to get compliance because we admit that these laws are not easy to, to uh, wrangle out and make sense out of, and that's why it's so great that Todd and his people have it all online. Um, I'm looking forward to, to a couple of new attorneys coming on to tow. Um, enforcement team and again grateful for the new members well for all members for the energy you put into being a pipeline so that we know what's happening on the street and can reflect what the real needs of the consumers and the industry are and if you have any questions I'm happy to answer them. I do have a question. On the uh, VSF top 10 fail to include required information on notice is that direct to enforcement? Yes. Okay. Is there any way we could make that not direct to enforcement or think about that? When we're talking little nitty-gritty items that don't affect the consumer um, because I know that's what a lot of that is some of it is and and yes definitely uh, we've heard you and whether or not uh oh uh oh here comes Charlotte <laughs> Um, I mean, that's getting huge. We did, I know it is, and we discussed this at our um, direct to enforcement meeting, mm -hmm. and we decided to leave that in there because it does actually affect the consumer. If they don't get their notice of rights, they miss out on timetables, they miss out on different things, and then it just becomes cumbersome whether or not they have all the information available. So it was determined to be a health and safety type situation to not have that information on the notice. It is preferred to inform the vehicle storage facility of what needs to be there and typically what our prosecutors will do is um, allow the person to show that they have fixed their documents mm -hmm. and then take that into consideration mm -hmm. but the documents are not getting fixed so I'm talking about things like failure to list what all was done for an impound fee things that don't that's different than what this violation is is I mean I'm, that's pretty important I agree and that's that's the violation, not the tow ticket. There's 101. The people didn't give the owners their rights. I'll let Michael answer that. I would have said exactly what Charlotte said. For you new people, Charlotte Melder is a supervising attorney for the tow and enforcement team. Well, actually, for all uh, so, prosecutors. So I mean, did did you say yes? It's 101 violations where they did, that's the rights of the vehicle owner. Oh, that's good to know, because that's a lot different than some of the other. Okay. <coughs> Thank you for That's that. That's right. I have a question, Madam Chair, Jeanette Rash. Um, Michael, I'm glad to hear about the data plate because I would really like to hear from industry whether this data plate <coughs> really has an impact on safety because I have a feeling it really has no impact. So I don't even know why it's been top 10 for as long as I can remember. And if that's the case, I, I think that we need to address and remove that. And I think we should put that on our list of rule revisions. I do. I mean, I, I, y'all have enough to do for the important things that's important to the public. And for our tow operators who you're, that seems nitpicky to them and it should because it's a data plate and you know, they come, they go, but you can have a pristine tow truck, but yet the data plate be missing. So can, let's look at that, Madam Chair, if you want to make a note of that. Well, let's I, I think it's one of several things we need it? to look at. Well, Todd okay. and uh, Tasha are looking at the rules right now. So we need to make kind of our mental list of things when we get an opportunity to go through these. And uh, there's a few other things we need to. So I really to. appreciate that y'all have already taken the initiative to, to look at that because it is about whether it's public safety or not. So uh, also, is is there that much penalties outstanding it says penalties assessed five million oh well that's that's the whole amount but for us it's still a considerable amount there's a considerable amount 
like half is still outstanding. The penalties for tow VSF, if you add them together, penalties that are collected, it seems like there's a, a lot of uncollected assessments. Are those real, Michael? I mean, yes, is that a the, real number? Yes. What? I mean, I, well, no, let me, well, let me as, explain as myself. You know. It, I know that you're doing agreed judgments. I didn't know if that was the first penalty that they were assessed and then you did agreed judgment for a lesser amount. Or is that the full amount that's still due? You see? When, when we issue the original notice of alleged violation from the prosecutors, mm -hmm. um, we offer a reduced penalty if they accept the determination of violation. Um, we also have additional negotiating authority based on what the prosecutor deems mm -hmm. to best serve the interests of compliance and deterrence. We can enter into a sum of money that then will resolve the penalty side. That, and that issues as an agreed order. Um, agreed orders generally don't have the collection problems that penalties have. But as you know, this is not an industry that's flush with money, right. uh, especially in the arena of um, unlicensed activity. Right. Um, and, and so the numbers that you see on the paper are real numbers. I will tell you, we have a number of devices for collecting everything from taking additional enforcement action for the violation of an order of the executive director to referral to the attorney general's office for full-fledged uh, collection through the court system. I, I think we are pretty aggressive in our collection activities, but especially with some of the fly-by-night businesses and people who just leave the state or shut down, uh, we just, we have to use the penalty assessment as a deterrent to other businesses rather than a revenue collection means for what the department is doing. And if we, have, <coughs> by assessing a penalty, even if we don't collect it, we prevent other, other licensees from violating the law, then our purpose is served. Well, for the public that might be listening, it's a 50, about 50 percent, give or take a little bit. That's assessed versus what's collected. That's why I asked. You know, I, I don't have access to the figures, the collection figures. Okay. Um, that seems a little bit low, but, but we, we don't just, if somebody doesn't pay, we don't just ignore it. Okay. Thank you. That's, that was my question. Anybody Madam, else? I do have a question, Madam Chair. Um, Tasha Mora, this is regarding the failed to include required information on notice. I appreciate the clarification um, that this is regarding the consumer rights. And I had a question as to, is there any information on those violations? Is it typically, potentially, um, notices that are distributed or provided, that should be provided manually, like VSS companies that are still, still doing everything manually? Mm -hmm. Um, rather than, or are they also included in those who are using software programs? Um, because there are some vendors that help provide that on their documents, and so it's generated. But uh, so my curiosity is, when there's uh, the failure to include the con the consumer rights, is there a tendency to see it in uh, from VSFs that are operating manually, where they're issuing these manually, or they're coming out of and generated through a software? The company might be using a software. The documents that are being issued to vehicle owners or operators when they recover possession of the vehicle generally are generated by the so by software providers. Okay. And keeping them up to speed with the legislative and regulatory changes has been a bear. You yeah. know, um, yeah. we're still seeing violations where the notice of rights tells vehicle owners to file in the precinct from which the vehicle was towed, whereas the law has been changed to being able to file in any court in any court in the county, um, we don't take a hard stance on those. If, there, if there's not consumer harm, unless the person like lost their right to a hearing, but no, the, the documents that we find the violations on are paper documents generated by the software that I think commercial vendors make out there. Does that answer your question? It does. Okay. It does. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. So, and based on that, would it be fair to say that um, the people that are involved in these violations for the electronic generation, would they have a possibly a defense to prosecution based on that because they're acting in good faith for the program that they're participating in? Well, I think good faith is always important in our assessment of a case. But no, if, if the document that's given to the vehicle owner or operator fails to meet the standards, there's, there's a prosecution. They're, they're responsible for the work and the documents that they produce.
Anyone else? Charlotte, Charlotte Melter, sorry for not introducing myself earlier. <clears throat> Todd just reminded me that on the issue of the documents, any time one of our prosecutors sees a violation of the documents not doing things right, she refers those to Todd and his group, and they get in contact with the person and get them in compliance with the letters. So hopefully, <coughs> this is going to be a thing of the past, yeah. but it, that process has been set up uh, with them to, to make sure that they're doing things the way they should be. Very good. And I think one of our goals as an advisory board would be to get the rules easier to comply with so they don't. I mean, they're very hard to, to comply with and stay up with, so that's a good step. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I just have a statement more to the board. You know, I always look at the fact that we are told VSF, and I haven't looked at the numbers in a while, but generally the average size of a tow company is three. Mm -hmm. That's our average. And they have their VSF. They're usually a mom and operation most part so you have to combine these penalties and then look at the average of other businesses regulated by TDLR and see that they have, what a big difference that it is in assessments and penalties and the department is working very very hard to address that because we are by far no question the most regulated businesses that they have, even though we are very small in population of what other businesses they do regulate. So that's why I focus on you really, when you look at tow VSF, that's probably just one business, or two licenses, more than not. Okay. So, but thank you, Michael, so much. Thank you, board members. Thank you. Makes a big difference. Our next item is field operations. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Tanya Guthro. I'm the Director of Field Operations, and that means our folks are out there in the field doing the inspections. The first item on our report is um, the top violations found during the inspections. And you guys just had a really good conversation about the top violations for enforcement. These are different. We are writing violations that may never you know, be sent to enforcement. So the first items here are for the tow company. You see that we had eight violations, different violations that rose to the top. These are uh, violations identified in the last quarter of um, fiscal year 2017. Next, we have our vehicle storage facility violations. <laughs> top signs. lanes. That's right, and they're just signs, signs. In fact, I wrote down here, I'm like, look at all those signed violations. Uh, but the majority of these, of course, we've been working with enforcement that many of these are not direct to enforcement violations. But we still try to educate um, the licensees while we're on site and help them get into compliance. Uh, next, our division uh, projects. I am super excited to say that we are doing all <coughs> of our tow inspections using our mobile or e-inspection now so that we're not doing any of those manually. That means our, our inspectors are out in the field with their tablets. They're writing the violations that are listed on the tablet, um, getting an electronic signature from the licensee, and then emailing the proof of inspection to the licensees. And if they don't do it at the time of the inspection, it's within 48 hours. Um, next up <laughs> is our vehicle storage facility. Um, inspection process that we're going to start to to work on and and make it so that we're doing both of these inspections uh, completely electronically. Another aspect to this that's important is this saves the inspectors from having to go back to the office and data enter the violations into the database. It electronically just transfers that information so that uh, it's a big time saver and increase in our efficiency. Also, uh, next up is our outreach. Um, I am proud of our East Region. All of the uh, management there and the inspectors did a great job in um, during um, and after the hurricane, you know, supporting licensees. You can see that 
our um, manager, Cam Tutron, um, provided information to the Houston and Dallas Vietnamese um, radio and TV stations. Uh, we also had Ulysses Osio um, helping out, providing information um, to Telemundo. Um, also, I want to announce that we are going to resume inspections on December 1st in the hurricane affected areas. We had suspended them in an effort not to get in the way of the recovery. Um, but I also want to point out that if we go to a business that has been affected or damaged by the hurricane, we uh, will just, you know, um, come back at a later time, we'll, you know, s put a note in the system and say, you know, come back in two or three months. If we happen upon a business that has been damaged and, and is in the um, middle of rebuilding. Um, and uh, we've got four new inspectors that we've hired with Suzanne Creed, Kwong Hong, Lindsay Wren, and Angela Sanders. Uh, and we are going to be interviewing, hopefully, right after Thanksgiving for three additional inspectors in the DFW area. Um, and that completes, well, we have our statistics. And I think considering that we had to suspend inspections in the hurricane-affected areas, we did a pretty good job um, overall for the whole state on our numbers this last month. Um, if you guys have any questions. Any questions? No? Well, that's good news that you have that the mobile running. Oh, time. so yeah, we're so excited. Yeah, we've been <laughs> logging on that for a long time. Yeah, really, a yeah, we're very excited. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Our next item is licensing. Good morning, <clears throat> and welcome to our new board members. Um, my name is Laura Hernandez, <clears throat> the licensing manager of the tools team. We handle the towing VSF uh, license, licensing for uh, companies and individuals. <clears throat> um, before you are the statistics, um, the ones I submitted for the last meeting didn't have the full quarter of, the la of our last quarter, so this one is a, has everything through F, uh, fiscal year 2017. Uh, we are still working on um, <clears throat> getting the dual licenses converted, so um, hopefully by the end of the next quarter there will be uh, some updates. Uh, you'll see a change because right now everything is still looking the same. The numbers aren't changing. Um, earlier you asked about the emergency licenses. Um, those are good through 1123. Um, the, since uh, their own emergency licenses for operators are only good during the de declared disaster. So the last time they were able to apply was on 10-20. <clears throat> so that end date will be 11-23. Um, if it extends, um, we're still helping those that currently have a regular tow operator license for waiving fees and things like that. There were um, 1,190 individual uh, tow operators, uh, emergency tow operators issued <clears throat> since 10 um, Between the time it opened, it was like August 25th through 10-20. There were 1,190. Um, for tow companies, there really wasn't an emergency tow company license. It's just a regular license that they would apply for, and that is a full year license. It's not just during the emergency. They paid for the whole year. <clears throat> there were 58 of those licenses, uh, or 58 applications that we received that where the company um, stated that they were specifically here for the emergency. Um, but we had a total of 89 that actually paid, but only 58 were actually issued. But if they paid, they could still get that regular license. Um, but if you have any other questions, that's hey, all I Laura, have. Uh -huh. um, the uh, continue, continuing education requirements have been suspended for those affected. The how long is there a? Is that for the entire year, or how does that work? No, it's through the declared disaster, and right now, uh, unless it's unless you know the disaster is extended, it's going to be through eleven twenty through Monday. Okay. They'll be waived after and that. So is it waived, waived for those that had them during that time and they d they wait till next year to get it or do they have to get it now? Now. Okay. That wasn't clear in the communications mm -hmm. to me. Um, 
if they had applied, even if they had applied, maybe they had renewed the license back in, I don't know, say July. Uh -huh. But then now we were, if they called in and, and maybe the CE requirement wasn't there, we were waiving, we're waiving that CE requirement. Okay. Are but you if, waiving it for this renewal or just for this time period? That's what my question for is. For this renewal. Okay. For this so renewal. They, mm -hmm. they don't so they won't need it for another year. year. Right. That's exactly. Question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have mm -hmm. a question on licensing? Mm -hmm. Very good. Thanks. Thank you. Our next agenda item is um, discussion of possible recommendations on five, <coughs> And I think we can probably get this done before a break. We'll break after this. And oh, then. That's what I would okay, very good. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be long. <coughs> Again, Elizabeth Salina Strip Matter with the General Counsel's Office. Um, as I talked about in my presentation today, we are going to review rules that were published through the Texas Register on October 13th as they related to both Chapter 85 and 86. Um, and today, I'm going to present to you those comments. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to um, determine whether those comments affect the current draft of the rules, and if so, uh, as a board, decide what action you wish to take. Um, is everybody clear on the process? I just want to make sure that everybody's clear where we are in the process. Okay. Why don't you kind of explain it for the new folks? Okay. So what happened at the last meeting was that um, we took all of the statutory changes that were made um, during this past session and we looked at the rules and we said what needs to be updated or changed or withdrawn pursuant to any statutory changes that occurred during session. Um, we then took the rules and modified, created, or withdrew rules pursuant to the statute, presented them at the last meeting to the board, and how we do it is we go rule by rule by rule. Uh, that's why this is a very long process, and that's why Joanne was saying we'll probably take a break after this. Um, so what happens then is that there was a motion made um, and a vote taken to go ahead and publish the rules as they were presented at the last meeting for public comment with changes that we discussed in, in, in the meeting. Um, those rules were published and then uh, beginning on October 13th to November 13th, the general public had the opportunity to submit those comments. Those comments are what we will talk about here today and you will determine as a board whether those comments affect the proposed rules as they were published in the register. You will have an opportunity to decide at that point whether you would like to send the rules for adoption to the commission in December or whether you want additional changes. Um, and we can talk more about that as we get into those questions and concerns. But that's the high level view of what we're doing. So if you will look at your paperwork, what we're going to tackle first is chapter <coughs> 85. Um, and what I'm going to do is we, we got a good number, a healthy number of comments. We didn't get, a, 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 I think, as many as most people thought we would get, including myself. But we got a healthy number of comments. Um, and they seem to be all concentrated among two particular rules. But what I need to do is I need to go through rule by rule. And for each rule, I'm going to tell you whether there were any comments and what those comments were. Okay, and then uh, Joanne will direct any uh, discussion about the rule. But if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to interrupt me and, and we can go from there. Um, but I, I want to do this in a way that everybody is on the same page about what's happening. So if you're confused about where I am or what, what comment I'm talking about, um, please let me know. So first we're going to look at Chapter 85 on vehicle storage facilities. Now for Chapter 85, we received a total of seven people who sent in emails uh, commenting on the rules. Now, that doesn't just mean we got seven comments. There were some people that sent multiple emails or had multiple comments within one email. So we will go through each of those um, and we're just going to go rule by rule. So on 85201, um, for those of you who are new, we're striking through um, number 11. Numbers 1 through 9 on 85201 have no change. You'll see that indicated in the parenthetical. Um, a line straight through means that it was struck out. So 11 was struck, um, and then we were just renumbered accordingly. We received no comments on 85201, which for those who may be watching and those in the audience is the license requirements for vehicle storage facility license. On 85204, which is the license requirements for vehicle storage facility employee licenses, um, we received one comment. 
um, and I'll just kind of run you through 85204. On 85204, you see under B, we struck out some existing language uh, and pursuant to the statute, we inserted language, which is the underlined language <coughs> on a person may not work at a VSF unless the individual holds. And this is a statutory change, and so this rule change directly mirrors what the statute says. Um, we received, as I said, one comment on 204, but that comment um, was actually more of a question in relation to contractors that may come to do uh, landscaping work. That is not a comment directly relating to the rule. It is a comment directly related to uh, compliance. And so the public, if uh, this particular person, if he wants a response to that, uh, should, co should contact compliance, or we can also see if maybe Todd can go. Todd said he'll <coughs> go ahead and respond to that. So we will get a response for the business owner on that. Um, and th that was the only comment that we received on 85.204. And I'll go through um, each one. I forgot to do it on 85.201. Does the board have any questions relating to 85.201? Does the board have any questions relating to 85.204? Okay. Moving on to 85.205. Um, that is the license requirements for dual vehicle storage facility employee and towing operator license. Um, that's going away pursuant to the statute, so that is just being stricken, and we did not receive any comments on that. Does the board have any comments or questions related to 85205? Okay. Moving on to 85206, those are the license requirements for vehicle storage facility employee license renewal. Um, and as you can see, we strike out the language of dual vehicle storage facility employee and towing operator license because pursuant to 205, that license is, is going away. Um, so all we did was a title change and we did not receive any comments on that. Um, does the board have any questions related to 85206? Um, 85.450, inspections generally was amended to strike out uh, risk-based schedules, and that's because pursuant to the statute, risk-based schedules are going away. So all we did was update that rule to take out reference to risk-based schedules. Now we did receive one comment on 85450, and the comment wanted an addition after periodically um, to say, to add, to warn a BSF if a violation is found. Um, generally don't think that, that that language is is necessary. I think it's pretty clear when we do an inspection um, that it's to notify if any violations are found, um, but the board can certainly decide if they think that that language needs to be written. Uh, Joanne, would you like to open a discussion on that? Um, anybody want to pursue that? Okay, I think we can move on. Okay, great. Okay, 85451. <coughs> periodic inspections A through D have no change. Uh, e is stricken to reflect, again, removal of the risk-based schedule inspections. Um, <coughs> does the board have any, no comments on that, does the board have any questions related to 85451 periodic inspections? Okay. Um, 85452, <coughs> that rule is being stricken. Again, it relates to risk-based inspections. That is going away pursuant to the statute. We received no comments on 85452. Does the board have any questions in relation to that rule change? Um, 85.650, towing storage uh, advisory board was changed because in 2018 we're going to deregulate booting. So we have stricken out the title booting. You will also see a change here in the um, addition of uh, an, a member of insurance uh, and a person who operates both the towing company and a VS, VSF storage facility. Um, you'll see for, by statute the legislature removed the public member. Um, we only received one comment on that, and the comment relates to, give me a second here. Um, the comment relates to that um, instead of striking out owner, um, we should put representative slash owner. Um, I will say that this language uh, mirrors the statute. Um, it's not an option for us to put in representative slash owner because that's not what the statute says. Does anybody have any comments related to 85650? Okay, so 85703 is where we get, I think, into some substantive discussion on the rules. We got, we got some um, 
comments related to 85703, several of the different sections. And so what I'm going to do on that rule is I'm going to run us through um, each of those sections and we'll talk about the comments as they came in um, on that rule. So on 85703 is responsibilities of licensees and this is the notice to the vehicle owner or lien, lien holder. 85703 had no comments. Um, does the board have any questions related to the changes in 85703A? 85703B, um, let's see, that is how, um, how they shall be noticed. Um, and on B1 through 2C2, there were no public comments. Um, again, the language in here is mirroring statute uh, on C1 through 2. Those are statutory changes that we're obligated to insert into the rules, um, and the rest were uh, changes that were made to sort of clean up that, that section. Does the board have any comments or questions about 85703B1 through 2 or 85703C1 through 2? No. Okay. Um, moving on to 85703 C, we did receive one comment from a gentleman, um, actually I don't, I don't actually don't know whether it was a gentleman <coughs> or, or a woman, um, but from a consumer who does not like that we are striking this language. So we discussed this language at the last board meeting. This language, this is kind of unusual because this is actually an affirmative defense um, for an enforcement <coughs> action. And generally in rules you do not have affirmative defenses. It still exists in statute. So if um, somebody was being enforced on this issue, they could fall back on the statute and assert their affirmative defense. Taking this out does nothing to affect the availability of the affirmative defense for the person who is being prosecuted. Um, so leaving it in, um, from, from my perspective as the assistant GC, is it just doesn't, it's odd, it's awkward in rules and you don't see it and we're actually trying to strip out these affirmative defenses whenever we see them, um, but they still do exist. Um, so his concern, uh, I think, seems to be that maybe that defense would go away. The defense doesn't go away. It just comes out of rule. Um, are there any questions on that change? Okay. Um, on 85703D, um, we have a drafting correction um, that was uh, commented on um, by a member of the public, which I agree with. Um, let me find that very quickly. No, actually it's not this one, it's another one. Excuse me, I misspoke on that one. We do not have any comments related to 85703D. Does the I have a comment. You have a comment, okay. Um, I think that is a <coughs> drafting error. Okay, um, oh yes. That was my comment. Mm -hmm. The uh, postmark on the return receipt is not what we want there. Okay. We don't know where that re if that return receipt will ever come back. That's right. I do remember that conversation from the last meeting. So if we could reword that, uh, we need the postmark that's entered when it's mailed on the 3800 form, the firm book, the letter. It could be any of those. So I don't know how you want to word that. I think we probably could word it as you're suggesting that the that. Um, Notification has occurred when the United States Postal Service places its postmark on the 3800 form, letter, or form book. It's, it's actually firm book. Firm book, excuse me, firm book. Okay. Does that sound okay to you, to the board? Are you all okay? Does that cover it all? I mean, it does cover it all. Okay. Eighty-five-seven-zero-three. E received a comment, a couple of comments, um, two comments actually, and I think that there seems to be a misunderstanding of the reading of the rule. The comments, con the comments concern the question of, well, are you saying um, that we can't charge for the first twenty-four hours that the vehicle is in our facility? 
That's not actually what we're saying. You have to read the entire rule that begins at E. So what E says is, if a VSF sends a notice required under this section after the time mandated by subsections B1 or B2, um, the, uh, a VSF may not charge the daily storage fee. So what that means is you have to look back on your time frames listed at B1 and B2, which is noticed within five days. So if a business owner blows that first notice deadline of five days, then they cannot collect for the first 24 hours. But if you are following your time, if you're timely noticing and you're doing it within yeah. five days, you have no problem. Right. You can charge for the first 24 hours. So I just want to make it real clear that the industry understands you have to read the entirety of that rule from E all the way down to E2, and then you have to refer back to your time frames that are explained in B1 and B2. Um, in order to understand that rule. So that's the problem with compliance. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> but yeah. I just want to make it clear you can't charge for any of those days, not just the first 24 hours, if you're late sending out your first notice. That's right. So send out your that's first right. notice on time so you can get your So you can fees. get your money. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, that's not TDLR doing that, that's the statute doing that because there was a comment of, uh, uh, relating to why is TDLR penalizing the business owners, it, it's actually not TDLR, it's the statutory requirements that now exist in law pursuant to SB 1501. Okay. okay. Uh, Madam Chair, Elizabeth, can we go back up, I'm sorry, on D again because yes, I had a question because I do electronic mm -hmm. certified mail. Mm -hmm. The mailman, yeah, well, the mailman clicks it with his you know, he uses a scans little scans it. Scans it. He scans each you don't get a one. You don't get a postmark. He okay. literally scans each one. Okay. So I don't know if what we done would that be considered placing a postmark? Can, Electronic it, postmark. Yeah, I is, think so. Is number one? Uh, yeah, the postmark indicates the notice was mailed. Yes. There because would be a record at the postmark. Yeah, there would be a record at the post office, I believe. Yes. Maybe and we need to add electronic postmark in the yeah. list. Yeah. Okay, I well, prefer the, just to say, well, it's in number um, one. When they place their postmark. D1, maybe. it says the postmark indicates that the notice was mailed within the period mm -hmm. described. Mm -hmm. so and that's, that's any postmark. Right. That's Whether it's electronic postmark. or a physical right, postmark. Right, so can that be good enough, I think? Can you say now, that again? Jeanette? It's in D1. Look at D1. See, it says the postmark indicates <clears throat> that the notice was mailed within the period described by subsection B. So that kind of says it to me without trying to list out everything because mm -hmm. electronic, they're changing things mm -hmm. before, you know, rapidly and we're trying to get something that works. <coughs> How about notification has occurred when the United States Postal Service places its postmark and is timely filed if the postmark indicates? Just I, places its postmark. I would agree to that because um, we're it's already being defined when the United States Postal Service places its postmark, and then to yeah. further <laughs> define it, it was yeah, unnecessary. It's the United States Postal Service yeah. places its postmark. Yeah, however right. they do it. So just strike return on the return receipt. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. And then it. So just just to be clear on the record, yeah. we are moving away from the suggested change a few minutes ago which says the, the postmark on the 3800 form letter or firm book. We're not actually putting that language in now. We are just striking out on the return receipt and postmark exists, postmark and is timely filed if, correct. and then we go into one and two. Yes, yes. that'd be correct. Thank okay. you, thank you. Yeah, it worked fine before we changed it. It was good. Yeah. <laughs> Overthought it. If you'll just give me a minute here, I want to make sure that uh, I'm making you aware of all of the comments. Okay. Um, 85703E, or is everybody okay with that, or do you have any further questions now that I've clarified the actual reading of the rule? Will Will Todd like that? Would is he so busy? Could he on the people that commented like make sure that they know that we considered it because we want to encourage people to that we do listen to their comments and if we they heard back then they would know definitely that we well, had. Well, no. Thank you. 
85703F. We received a comment. Um, this again refers back to, and this is a drafting error um, that we caught uh, as we were looking at the comments. <coughs> Um, so we think that 85703 F3 yeah. is, must be or should be changed to actually say, um, if mailed, such requests shall be correctly addressed with sufficient postage and sent by certified mail, return receipt requested, or electronic certified mail. Um, Currently, it says, if mailed, such requests shall be correctly addressed with sufficient postage and sent by certified mail or electronic certified mail return receipt requested to the governmental entity with which the vehicle is registered requesting information relating to the identity of the last known registered owner and any lien holder record. It was brought to my attention um, that we don't get return receipt requested necessarily on an electronic certified mail. So we should actually drop that and the new wording should be certified mail return receipt requested because you do receive return receipt on physical certified mail right. or electronic certified mail. Right. So we would just clean up the drafting error there. Plus that will match statute. Yeah. And it will match statute, that's yeah. correct. Does anyone have any questions or concerns about that drafting change? Okay. I, I, I don't know if we just, if we're past Clarification done on F, the notice required under the section. Did we? Are we past that? We're on F. We're on F. Yeah. Okay. We're on F3. Okay. So my question is the way it currently reads is F is notice required under this section may be completed by publication in a newspaper of general circulation. Mm -hmm. Is that specific to a paper publication rather than an electronic pu publication? I'm not sure how licensing has or compliance has been interpreting that, Todd. And the reason that I ask is because as a consumer, I would imagine in today's age of doing a search electronically, if I'm looking for my vehicle that might have been published, published I might be able to do a search electronically to those pub electronic publications. It's to a newspaper in general, general circulation in the county in which the vehicle is stored. Now, a, a lot of times what you'll see is, it, it, it's not specific, okay. but a lot of times what you see is they'll have an online edition. Yes. Okay. And the, the, everything, the ads and classifieds come up in the online edition yeah. as well as in the public, okay. published. Um, if you wanted to just do an electronic, I don't really see how that would work. I don't know if there's really even a way you could do that with just the, just the uh, online, but I in think that's something that may have to be addressed at some point. In rural Texas, that wouldn't be feasible. In rural Texas, that wouldn't be feasible because there's still a lot of, you know, I'm in a county of 4,000 people. The county newspaper in print is still the go-to source for any information. And I don't think we're looking at anything exclusively, I mean, or anything like that, but maybe giving the option for that at some point in time. Right. You know, I don't if, know. If that's an option. I mean, if, if, we, if, it, yeah. if the, uh, the publication were published in an electronic copy or version, uh, would that be a violation because we need to have it in Would it be a violation if it was just electronic? Yes. And, but it was it was a news it was an online site specifically for that newspaper in general circulation in the county. Yes. I would say no. Okay. Thank you. Again, I don't I don't think that that's very common. I think when they place the ads, they place them on both generally. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just want to walk back to eighty five seven zero three F two. Um, there were some changes and some additions to that. I'll read it. The VSF submits to the governmental entity that is responsible for maintaining the motor vehicle title and registration database for the state in which the vehicle is registered or to a private entity that is authorized by the governmental entity to access title, registration, or lien holder information, a written or electronic request for information relating to the identity of the registered owner and any lien holder record. Um, that language, again, is reflected in statute. Um, as, as you may be aware, um, the legislature is now allowing um, you all to go to either the state or to a uh, third party vendor to receive that information so that you can provide your notice. Um, so all we did was update to to reflect that statutory change. 
Are there any questions related to that? Uh, I believe that we have talked about three, unless, Madam Chair, you have some something additional that you'd like to bring in on three. Okay, and as you see, we just renumbered um, three, four, and five to four, five, and six. Um, G was re-lettered from F, um, and then a reference to a subsection was taken out. Um, and those are just some minor, there are some minor drafting changes. Uh, and we did not receive, I don't believe, but we did receive one additional yes, comment. Yes. We have a comment um, from someone who said, uh, seems to think uh, or believe that, and I, I will direct the board to Tom Drake's comment that came in on Monday, November 13th at 1.01 p.m. It's, it's actually fairly lengthy. Um, he says that there is a problem when the information changes uh, on a vehicle vehicle's owner between the time of the first notice and the time of the second notice. Um, apparently there is a problem in the instances in which that occurs with getting DMV to provide the title for those um, cars. That is a DMV issue. Um, that's not a TDLR issue. Um, our interpretation has been and continues to be what he says here. Uh, the law has been interpreted that a vehicle storage facility can rely on the information provided directly from the state or to the third party, since now the third party has been added, at the time of obtaining the registration and lien holder information and no additional notice is required and there's no need to restart the process. If there is some kind of requirement by DMV that, that you have to update that information and restart the notice process, that is a DMV issue. That is not a TDLR issue. Um, he wants us to insert into the rule um, a new section which would, which would I guess, make it clear that um, it's, you don't have to restart the notice. Um, but we're not saying that you have to restart the notice. That's never been our interpretation. And if there are problems locally, either with the DMV or the local, um, local offices, that's an issue that needs to be taken up there and not at the state level. So um, I think it can be addressed by an FAQ if need be down at some yeah. point. So um, uh, we I can certainly do that. And I think to, uh, Todd told me prior to today's meeting he would circle back to Mr. Okay. Drake. Um, and we will look at the possibility of an FAQ. This is the first time that I've been made aware of this issue, and we didn't receive any other comments stating that. Um, it, but however, if the board thinks that this is becoming a problem down the road again, our rules process allows you to come back in and, and take a look at any of these rules at any time. And I have not heard of it being an issue recently, so it may be a one-off situation. Mm -hmm. I had a, um, just one of the concerns or I guess a question that I had regarding this is the effect that it may have um, on the consumer and also the VSF owners or operators is right now we're relying on the information that's provided by the state or our third party. Um, occasionally, more times than not, what I have seen um, is that there is a lien holder on a vehicle. However, it may not be a current lien holder, but mm -hmm. the lien holder failed to do their process and remove their name. And I practice that with my own vehicle, with family vehicles and such. And I saw that I'm showing a, a lien holder on my 2009 vehicle. Um, that concerns me because some of these lien holders, it may be from smaller um, areas, maybe cells and such, um, that offers them the opportunity to come back and claim the vehicle. So my concern is how does that protect that consumer, the registered owner, um, if in fact that, into, that lien holder is no longer an active lien holder. Um, also as a VSF owner and operator, um, sometimes when those vehicles are not claimed, the best thing that we can do is try to reclaim and regroup some of those costs, the losses at auction. Mm -hmm. But if we have a vehicle that this lien holder that's currently still listed as a lien holder finds that that vehicle is valuable, right now with the process as it is, they have every right to come claim the vehicle. And there's no mm -hmm. stopping point for that. So well, they would have to legally repossess it, and right. they can't do that if they don't have a lien on it. So. See what I'm saying? But if their if, lien's gone, they can't repossess it. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, 
No, I'm obviously confused because the look on my face for sure. Mm -hmm. I just know that if an individual represent, presents themselves and they have a VSF form, then we are releasing this vehicle to that individual, you know, and they're claiming to be the lien holder. Because you have the repossession papers as well, but if there's a VSF form in the mix there, mm -hmm. then we're releasing this vehicle. Well, and, and unfortunately, I think that's an issue that's outside of the rule, right? I mean, that's that's really a problem with information not being updated in the database. Right. The database is not operated by TDLR. <coughs> right. um, so unfortunately, all we can do is write the rule so that it, it addresses as close to 100% of the population as we possibly can get it. If there is an instance where you have an old lien holder who's showing up on a, on a search for a business owner, um, Madam Chair is correct, you've got to release it. Um, you know, I acknowledge that that may be a problem, but that is not something that I think TDLR can address because we don't, we don't operate those databases. We don't have any responsibility for those databases. Madam Chair, I'd like to interject something here. When we started out, we required that lien holders bring the affidavit right of possession that is Department of uh, Motor Vehicles document mm -hmm. showing they have a right to repossess because this is a huge issue and it really does not protect the public because the document's easy to get. They print it offline. They use it all the time. They have to whenever they roll titles over on top of it. So I think that it'd be good, Madam Chair, if we went back and tried to address that in the proper way. It was in the list of documents originally that could be used to obtain a vehicle, that specific form from DMV. And I think we could go back and do that because it really is abused by these small car lots that come and get the people's cars and then will charge them whatever to get their car back. Sure. Sure. And they won't let them have their property back. Sure. I had a personal experience with them not allowed, letting them have their personal property back. Uh, yeah, given the fact that you all are saying that this is a problem within the industry, I would yeah. suggest that perhaps this is something that we take up in the next round of rules. Yeah. Perhaps yeah. it may be ripe for a work group to actually flesh out the discussion on this and to come up with the best case scenario yeah. and solution. Yeah. Um, it, Unfortunately, at this time, I don't think it justifies holding back the publication, yeah. the, the adoption of the rule, but it's certainly something that we can continue to look at um, and respond to the concerns um, from the business owners and the consumers. Okay. Uh, because we always do want to be responsive, as we said repeatedly here, to both the businesses and to the consumers. And if there, there is an instance or multiple instances where we are seeing consumers are, are somehow being harmed, um, if, there is, if there is something we can do in our rule to try to add some correction to that, we will. However, just remember that we don't control those databases. Um, but, I, but I do see the logic in saying, well, maybe we could require some additional paperwork and we can look back and see what um, was required at the previous agency. As, as far as the affidavit of repossession, the, uh, there's two VSF forms on our website, the VSF 10 and the VSF 11. The VSF 10 is a notarized power of attorney that a lien holder can bring with, along with the affidavit of repossession. But it doesn't say along with the repossession. Yes, it does. Oh, Only it for does? Me. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. So okay. The, the affidavit of repossession in and of itself isn't an instrument of release, but in order to execute the VSF 10, you have to have the affidavit of repossession. Will you add that in your work groups because VSF's been told different yes. than that? Absolutely. Because they're told they cannot mm -hmm. ask for that. Right. And, and, so, and so I, that's yeah. Why I thought it wasn't there anymore because. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, the, it's, so wrong. it's actually the VSF 10 form, the power of, notarized okay. power of attorney, which okay. requires the affidavit of repossession. Great. That's great. So it's a matter of education, and we'll yes. get that done. See, she didn't know it. She runs a VSF. Right, because we were, and I've attended some trainings as well, and I still myself was under the impression that if someone presents that notarized VSF yeah. 11 form, we're to release the vehicle, yep. Yep. you know. So the answer you is yes. Are. I'm you are. Yes. <laughs> right. So a lien holder would have to you. file an affidavit of repossession, and that would be fraud. Yes. There's yeah. No yes. Lien on yeah. The exactly. Okay. So exactly. The, I mean, you can't fix people that commit fraud. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. And a and a rule wouldn't fix that. Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Right. Um, okay. Does anybody have any further questions on J? Um, you will see we just we, we struck some language um, to update update it to say if authorized a notification fee may not be charged unless actual notice has been given as required under this section to clarify that rule. 
Um, does anybody have any questions or concerns about anything related to 85703? Elizabeth, we did get a comment about H. H. Yes, about the certificate of authority and the impact on the certificate of authority. So I think that. I'm sorry, what comment are you referring to? Let me find it. It's set where he says that he can, he's, uh, uses the certificate of authority. Um, I know it's here. Yeah, I saw it. And then it would. He thinks he'd have to send this. Here it is. Oh, I here see. It is. I yeah. see. From Mr. Mauer? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So No, that's on 704. 85704. Isn't that 85704? I regarding the second notification because well this is the first right. notice but I I wanted to to say to him that in H and this is where <coughs> I cross-referenced because it says only one notice is required to be published for an abandoned nuisance vehicle and the certificate of authority is one document and then the abandoned nuisance vehicle is another document for cars that are going to be parted or crushed Mm -hmm. So he might look at using this document instead of the certificate of authority to keep from having to do this. Oh, I see. You have a solution for Correct. his concern. Yes. Right. Because when I spoke to Todd in licensing about Mr. Maurer's comment, um, what what he's what he was going to and he's going to follow up with Mr. Maurer, but he was okay. going to uh, he was going to direct his attention to 85.724. Um, which would be the disposition of abandoned nuisance vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, that what he the question he's action, asking is taken up in 85.724, not 703 or 704. So the answer to his question lies there, and there's no actual conflict. Well, in the it, law, they're two complete different documents that DMV. Yes. So there's. Yes. Yeah. But he will follow up with Good. him to make Good. sure that he is um, on the on the right path to understanding. Um, what he needs to do in those situations. Thank you. Yes. Um, are there any further questions on 703.703? Okay, moving on then to 85.704, um, which are the responsibilities of the licensee second notice consent to sale. Um, we just talked about the comment from uh, Mr. Maurer related to 85.704. Mm -hmm. There were no co no further comments, but we do have a drafting error. Um, and let me, the drafting error is going to be in 85.704E1. The information listed in 85.703H2, it should actually be I2. Um, so we need to go ahead and change that uh, before we send it off to the Commission. All right, let's run through 85704 since we've already um, addressed that comment. So uh, this is the second notice consent to sale. And again, the changes that were made in this rule were made pursuant to the statutory changes. They were not changes that TDLR unilaterally decided or that the Board decided were necessary. We were seeing changes reflected as mandated by statute. Um, so in A, um, we had no public comment on that. Do you all have any further comment? We talked about this last time, but do you all have any further comment on A? No? Okay. On B, um, 1 through 2, again, that statutorily mandated language, do you all have any further comment on that? Um, B, 1 through 2, and then A, B, and C. A, capital A, capital B, capital C. Do you have any comments on that? Okay. A little c, this is in regards to the timing of the second notice. Again, that statutorily mandated language. Do you have any questions or concerns related to c as it's currently written? Okay. Uh, d is just a re-lettering. Uh, e1, we've talked about there needs to be a change in the draft to reflect the correct citation um, to the rule. Are there any further comments related to 85704? from the board or do you, did you see any comments that I inadvertently missed related to 85704? Uh, Elizabeth, I just wanted to say that uh, this is something that the industry's got to work with DMV on the notices for to law enforcement, mm -hmm. what forms, 
how you document that law enforcement does or doesn't take the vehicle into custody or require the payment. So that is something, like you said, that's going to be DMV that's want, going to want specific information. <coughs> so it's incumbent upon those that have a second notice to make sure that they're in compliance with DMV. That's right. I mean, we, what I see happening is that you and the industry have two state agencies that you're dealing with at any given yeah. time. Yeah. And so um, we will address what we can address on the TDL, TDLR side yeah. and then issues that are arising on the DMV side. That's a completely yeah. separate agency and we have no authority to, to comment or to, to attempt to change. TDLR doesn't, but the industry certainly has the ability to talk to DMV <coughs> if they would choose to do that or individual business owners. Okay. Um, 85.722 is the responsibilities of the licensee relating to storage fees and other charges. Um, we just made some uh, changes again to update it pursuant to the statute um, and to update it um, so that we have um, some additional language you'll see on 1, 2, and 3. Um, we added in a VSF may not charge a vehicle owner or authorized representative um, because we were listening to the industry on that, that we needed to have more than just the owner reflected on both one, two, and three, that you can also have the authorized representative uh, there. On three, um, that's just striking out some language related to uh, mailing. Uh, no comments on any of these. Uh, and these are just, again, uh, language that's being updated to, uh, and to take out certain terms. Does the board have any questions related to 85722? Oh, I'm sorry. We actually did receive one comment. And the comment was actually not a comment. It was a question. Uh, so uh, this is not the forum for, for a question. Um, but it, the question was asked is how much is the fee in this section as it was approved 12 years ago by the legislature? Um, Todd will circle back to the commenter on this, but my understanding is that the, the fee has never been set, even though it has it. We have the authority to do it; it's just never been set. So, and eighty-five point uh, zero zero on fees. Again, we're just striking out uh, the dual license. Uh, charges the risk-based inspections and we received uh, no comments on that. Does the board have any questions or concerns related to 85.722? Okay. Um, we did receive, uh, oh and then let me go through 85.800 on fees. We, we said we were okay. 85.100 on technical requirements related to storage <coughs> lot signs. We did receive one comment from the owner of a repo company. Um, and Todd is going to, to circle back to him because we think he's misunderstanding um, this issue here uh, and that he's possibly using the wrong form. Um, but I did want to raise one thing that he said was uh, he asked if there could be an exemption on signs for repo owners who only have a VSF when they want to um, enact a lien. And so the department's response is if you're choosing to be licensed or if you want to be licensed as a VSF and you're holding that license, you have to comply with all of the, the rules and the regulations related to that. We don't have exemptions for people who do just a particular thing or might only use that license once or twice a year. Um, you are expected to comply with all of the rules and requirements. There's not gonna, there's not an exception at this time. Now, if that's an issue the board wants to take up, then that's certainly within your purview, but I just wanted to make sure that, that you understood um, what that comment was saying. It's consent storage. He's not regulated. He can store and ha do mechanic liens as a consent storage facility. It has nothing really to do with us, Elizabeth. There's yes. no sense in us and I agree. addressing that. And I agree, but that's, you know. Yeah, I know it's a comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and again, Todd will circle back to him um, to make sure that we can get him on the right page to, to get him to understand that perhaps he might be using the wrong form and going about it the wrong way. Um, those are, those are the total of the comments and the rules. Uh, and now I will turn it over to uh, Madam Chair for any further action that the board may wish to take. Is there anything <coughs> that, um, any 
questions, concerns on anything we talked about so far? I've got uh, three items. Elizabeth? Yes, ma'am. Um, 85.703D. Yes. Strike on the return receipt. Mm -hmm. 85.703F3. Mm -hmm. uh, We're going to match it up to the match statute. The statute. Mm -hmm. Certified mail return receipt requested or electronic <coughs> certified mail. Mm -hmm. And then 85.704E1 should be changed to I2. Yes. And that's all I have that we're going to change. Do I have a motion to approve that, those changes to the rules before we send to the commission? Motion, Jimmy Spears. Do I have a second? I'll second, Amy Milstead. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. We got 85. That wasn't too painful, was it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yes, so I believe that I believe you all might want to take a break before we go into 86. Yes. Let's break uh, until about it's about six till 12. Let's break till 10 after 12 and come back and finish up.
going to call the Towing and Storage Advisory Board back to order. <clears throat> and we're ready for agenda item H, discussion and possible recommendations to the Commission on proposed amendments to Chapter 86. Elizabeth Salinas, Strip Matter for the uh, Assistant General Counsel for the agency. Uh, we're going to move into Chapter 86 and we're going to follow the same format that I followed for Chapter 85. Feel free to stop us and ask any questions. Um, I think we are going to have some substantive discussion on one particular rule here. Um, so we'll allow uh, the chair to guide and direct that discussion. Um, but I wanted to make you aware of how many, com how many comments we had. Um, we had one, two, three, we had six, six people submit uh, to the rules mailbox. However, um, three of those were not rules related. One was a complaint um, from a Mr. Moore that was sent to enforcement for further handling. So we will not be discussing that here today. Uh, and then there were two emails sent on uh, two emails sent on the same date at pretty much the same time from a licensee who had a question about his license. The emails are different, um, but for some reason their date and time stamped at the exact same time. Uh, but he had a question about his licenses, and we sent that over to licensing, so that didn't have anything to do with the rules, so we will not be addressing that here today. Um, and then we had a comment that was submitted to the rules mailbox, which said that the person was in agreement with all of the proposed changes. It's kind of rare that we see that, so, uh, but since he didn't really have any substantive comment, I just wanted to make note that we received it with one comment, uh, that somebody in the industry out there agrees with all of the changes, which I think is kind of a miracle. So, uh, I felt that was worth noting. And uh, so when we get rid of uh, those, after we've already talked about them, what we are left is three comment, three uh, submissions. And again, we have one that has multiple comments uh, on multiple rules. So as I go through the rules, I'll be addressing each of those in turn. Um, but so we're going to start at the very beginning of 8610 um, on the definitions. Um, we struck out uh, the definition of a property owners association. Uh, we renumbered accordingly, and we received no comments on that. Uh, does the board have any comments or questions related to the changes to 8610? Okay. 86.212 is struck again. Uh, you'll see some of the same things here in Chapter 86 that we see in Chapter 85. We want to make sure that both chapters um, are saying the same thing in relation to the same subject. So that's why you'll see some of the same uh, changes here in Chapter 86 that you see mirrored in Chapter 85. But 86.212 is the licensing requirements for dual vehicle storage facility employee and towing operator license. Again, that goes away pursuant to the statute, so we have struck that from the rules. We did not receive any comments on that. Uh, does the board have any comments or questions related to 86.212? Okay. Uh, I need to. Um, make reference to a withdrawal that we're doing on 86.213. That is the licensing requirements for towing operator training license. We inadvertently put this strike through in this round of rules, but the effective date of those tow training licenses going away is not until September 1 of 2018. So we are going to withdraw this rule because it, shouldn't, it, should, it should still remain in our rules until a later date, but we will propose striking it on another round of rules. So we will still strike it out, but we're not going to do it at this particular time. So I'm going to ask for the board permission to withdraw that rule um, from, from our draft. Uh, and are there any questions or concerns related to that? On 86.450, which are inspections, we did again receive one comment. It is the same comment that we received in Chapter 85, where the consumer wants us to add language um, to state a towing company shall be inspected periodically, and he wants the language added to warn a towing company of a violation if found. Um, again, I don't think that there's really any basis for adding that language because we do conduct inspections for the sole purpose of notifying if violations are found. Um, are there any questions or concerns about 86.450? Okay. Uh, 86.451 periodic inspections. Um, we amended the portion of that rule um, 
that talks about periodic inspections because periodic inspections go away pursuant to the statute. We did not receive any comments on 86.451. Does the board have any comments or concerns on 86.451? Okay. Uh, 86.452, we're striking out risk-based inspections because again, risk-based inspections go away pursuant to the statute, uh, statutory changes from this legislative session. Uh, we did not receive any comments on 86.452. Does the board have any questions or concerns? Okay. Uh, 86.650, we have the same comments here. This relates to towing and storage uh, advisory board. We're striking the title to, um, because booting is being deregulated again in 2018. So we're, we are changing the title of that rule. And we are also reflecting the statutory changes to the composition of the board from 10 to 9 members. Um, and f and to um, <clears throat> to show uh, that our rules are reflecting what the statute says that we're adding a member uh, of an insu of the insurance industry and we are adding one person who operates both a towing company and a vehicle storage facility. Um, now the comments that just bear with me one second. Yes. Um, the comments that were made on that one were that we should not be striking out the word owner. Um, we should be using representative slash owner. Again, we struck the word owner because that was stricken in statute, so we need to mirror what the statute says. Um, we did not do that unilaterally. That is in compliance with the statute. Um, the question is why does, t and then a question was raised, why does TDLR want an insurer on the board? Um, TDLR, I would like to make it clear, TDLR did not decide who the composition, the, the composition of the board would be. That again came through statute and that should be a question that's directed to the legislature, um, not to TDLR. We are just again following what the legislature is telling us to do. Um, and I think, I think uh, his comments on the one representative or owner again uh, in nine he, he wants us to change the, the wording to one representative or owner um, instead of one person. Uh, and again, our language mirrors what the statute says. Um, so we, we really don't have much flexibility there. Um, does the board have, that? There, there was only one comment and those, that's what they were. Does the board have any further questions or concerns on 86.650? Okay. Um, 86.705, uh, we received a number of comments on 86.705 to the various sections. Um, and so we will go through those. Um, let me explain what 86, uh, what that rule actually does and then um, we can go into into the discussion on it. Uh, 86.705 relates to the responsibilities of a towing company standards of conduct. In this legislative session, uh, the legislature made several changes um, that would allow um, that would allow facility owners to do certain things on their property. Um, we created rules that you will see here. Uh, we added N, O, 1, 2, 3, A through B and C through C through G and then four, five, six, seven, and eight. So we added quite a bit to the rule. Um, I will say that the statute on, on this one, um, we were just directed to create the rules. There was, there was really not a whole lot of, of guidance from the state legislature. We were just told to create the rules. Um, and so we received quite a number of comments, one from the Texas Apartment Association, um, pointing out several issues with our language. Um, in sum, all three of these comments, well, two of the comments in sum, um, have concerns about um, the perhaps constrictive nature of the rules um, and, and the thinking that the statute is actually broader than what our rules reflect in terms of allowing um, apartment complexes to do things within their parking facilities. Um, and the other comment that we had was on 86.705N. Uh, we had a commenter who had really questions about, well, what if, if a consumer tells a storage, a, a towing company that they want the car taken to another location, 
Does it have to be taken to the other location? We can have a discussion on that. And then um, both the TAA and another consumer had um, questions and con or qu concerns related to the 10-day notice to relocate on a car in a, in a, a park uh, an apartment complex parking facility. Um, <coughs> so I will allow uh, Madam Chair to direct that conversation and we can refer back to the comments. I believe you all have the comments in totality in front of you. Um, and I believe there might be a few uh, board members who want to say specific things. Okay. Um, why don't we go item by item. Um, we'll talk about in. Vehicle owner operator may request that the vehicle be taken to another location. I'm not sure what this was intended to mean or if it's even needed. Um, I believe that that's in statute. I'm going to look. Because <clears throat> it doesn't really seem to fit here. Is that in statute? I don't remember that. Um, yeah, let me, let me just double check. I'm thinking that, let me read the, the statute that we are, that we're talking about. So, so in SB 1501, um, we, the legislature mandated changes or amended changes to 2308.205 of the Occupations Code. And they added A1 to say the commission shall adopt rules authorizing a towing company that makes a non-consent tow from a parking facility to tow the vehicle to another location on the same parking facility under direction of the parking facility owner, a parking facility authorized agent, or a peace officer. So you're correct. It's not it's not in that statute. So um, I've read it to you. Those are what the changes are. These are our rules. And, and uh, of course, this, that's what this forum is for, for you all to discuss. So I'm out. Todd, do you have a, do you know what that's supposed to be doing there? I think it's a, it's a parking facility owner. I believe that was intended to address the vehicle could go to one of two places, a place agreed upon by the vehicle owner or a licensed vehicle storage facility. If you're relocating it, it wouldn't go to one of those two places. I don't the think vehicle owner is not really involved yeah. at this point. Right, correct. So wouldn't that be the parking facility owner? Correct, but I think that's what that was intended to address. Okay. So <clears throat> I agree with you, Madam Chair. It should say a parking facility owner may request or representative request that a vehicle be taken to another location and then you get into the the what the statute the changes were mm -hmm. that's all okay so i think that okay the start of a relocation yeah. i don't think it has anything to do with that todd i think it's about the relocation Ro section no i understand but yeah. the, the part of the other part of, there's another part of the statute that says you can only take it to one of two places well if you're relocating it it's not going to one of those two places well i understand that but this section yes addresses I, I, the ability to do that i understand do you think we need something additional to clarify or something? Is that what? Maybe just in a different place. I want to say. But it should say a parking facility that. owner because it had nothing to do with the owner. No, absolutely. Um, let me check. <clears throat> Maybe we just need a statement referring back to that. Here's an exception to. I think that's what we had, but let me check. Or just stated that a parking facility owner, one, two, three, or something. Because the parking facility owner is the one. The, the, what we didn't want to have happen is the towing company to somehow get in trouble because they, even though the parking facility requested it, the towing company still has the requirement to take the vehicle to a licensed vehicle storage facility or a place agreed upon by the owner. Mm -hmm. And in that case, that wouldn't have happened. Right. Correct. But that's why this is in here now. Correct. He's just saying we need to address that just to make sure okay. it doesn't conflict. You know what I'm saying? Okay. You don't want it conflicting. Correct. Right. I, I could see where, and I don't know if this conflicts, but we're a potentially verbiage stating that a um, the property owner or authorized representative may request <laughs> that the vehicle be taken to another location on the property. I mean, I. I have Todd find the it, it, the it so the statute did update in 2308205 a dash one the commission shall adopt rules authorizing the towing company uh, that makes a non consent tow from a parking facility to tow a vehicle to another location on the same parking facility under under the direction of a parking facility owner so that that is giving the ability to do that but I, I think that's why it was in there twice okay, okay. 
So we, we're okay if we just change it to a parking facility owner or operator may request. Da, da, da. I, the vehicle I be taken so. to another location on the parking okay. facility property. You have okay. to say the whole thing because you don't want them taking them somewhere right. else either. Right. Okay. Are we good on that one? You're saying on That's the parking I'm facility saying, property? Yeah, the whole, right. That's the entirety. I heard, I heard a vehicle, I mean, excuse me, a property um, owner or operator, but would it be a um, property owner or authorized representative? That's better. That's better. <coughs> At that, sh should we also add in peace officer to that? Uh, to like what's in the statute? Do we need that? that? Well, uh, the statute controls. I, I don't. I mean, that, I guess that's the general council. We can add it in. Um, I, it, I don't think it affects it one way or another. It exists in statute, but for clarification purposes, it probably is better to have it in uh -huh. so that it mirrors the statute. Okay. <laughs> Madam Chair. Okay. Item O, <coughs> comments that it was too narrow to uh, just restrict it to apartment complexes or other residential housing. And I don't think that was the intent of the statute. I think um, the intent of the statute was to allow any property owner to move vehicles if need be. So I think we need to uh, address that. we have any comments on that? Kyle, do you have something? Sure. I mean, we just kind of noted the same thing. I mean, the, as you just said in the statute, as it was passed, was a little broader than just, you know, specific to apartment complexes. And, of course, while we certainly appreciate that, mm -hmm. tailored to us, I mean, I know there will be others who would like to do the, do the same thing, so. And I know we did have discussions during session with other uh, representatives that were, were needing this, too, so. Okay. Um, Do you want to address O1? Yes, that's the another the same. It's more narrow than I think the statute intended. Where there's a variety of reasons they would uh, need to relocate vehicles, such as the TAA comments, special events, parties, Wait. blood drives. Okay, what about 202? Or I'm sorry, it's just 2, it's not 02. 2, we've got another reference to all residents that we missed. Yes. That was a drafting error. The affected residents or not our vehicle owners. It's vehicle not residents. owners or operators. That's right. It may not be residents. Right. Yeah, if it's a uh, business office building, it's going to be a um, I, I also have a, a question regarding the statement that shall provide written notice. So, for example, official notice that towing will be enforced on a property is as long as a, the signs are compliant with a subchapter G and they're, they're uh, displayed at least for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. That's considered the official notice. Mm -hmm. So. Rather than being that specific, uh, the parking facility shall provide written notice. I think that if they were to display a, the signage at the entry points at least 24 hours in advance, um, would match with the other uh, requirements that is towing providers. And just for the record, we did get a comment that that mirrors mirrors your comment. Okay. Um, and. I don't actually have I, I don't have it right in front of me at this moment, but I thought that there was a comment that somebody made about um, having us uh, because of course we had the changes in SB 1501 related to university towing and the the signage is that you need the signs that you need to put up in advance of that, uh, and there was a suggestion that we do the same on this side to to address the what the problem that you raised. Right, and it it also helps notify because if towing is in force. Unauthorized vehicles are towed at the, own, the vehicle owner's or operator's expense. 
So the notification should be available to the vehicle owners or operators mm -hmm. rather than have to go to, quote, a resident, a leaseholder, and such. Any vehicle that's entering that property would be able to visib visibly see that notification and also mm -hmm. only require it to be up for 24 hours prior to any type of event or maintenance where this would apply to. Well, except the other provisions in SB 1501, as noted by TAA's comments, um, on relocation require 72 hours advance notice. So if we were going to <coughs> mirror, we want to mirror. I think what? 72 hours is good on a relocation issue because it's, um, you could have somebody who's gone for the weekend or I agree. You know, it's not too long short. and it's not too okay. short for a relocate. That way it gives them the, the opportunity to remove their vehicle and um, hopefully that's enough plan ahead time uh, for the business owner to schedule or know that there's going to be a an event. And or, the intent of these notices is to provide an additional notification other than the, the towing signs, right? This is for right. a special thing that's happening. Right. Mm -hmm. So just the regular towing signs are general signs, right? right. This is a different thing than that. I just want to make that clear. Right. And I, I guess that make sense to kind of. Well, the, back to the, the number of days, I agree mm -hmm. with the 72 hours. Okay. Um, I just, I think that 10 days, 10 calendar days is, there are times where that's not going to be feasible if there's right. maintenance that's needed on the property. But 72 hours could potentially be sufficient. And there is an out if there's an emergency, I think, in the Correct. rules. Correct. Yes. It is scheduled planned events yeah. and such. But this would have to be specific to that thing, right. not just the regular talks. I, I, I clearly hear that and I agree with that as okay. well. So I the towing enforcement signs are not right. sufficient. It would need to be an additional notification that's posted that is compliant to be able to um, notify everyone coming on. That's the right. And, and you see that if you look at the university towing rules, you see yes. that same thing there, that the universities have their regular towing signs, but when they're doing special event towing, they have to come in to, under the requirements of that statute. They have to have those additional signs. Mm -hmm. and there are various signs that are acceptable pursuant to the statute and, and the reason so these are author, otherwise authorized vehicles but for this special scenario they can't be in that area so we're going to relocate them the the regular towing signs wouldn't work because they are authorized vehicles they very well could be they could be residents mm -hmm. and um i want to right just to interject right here that i think that um we need to take this to a work group and do some more work on it before we finalize. I want to go through the discussion though and get everybody's input. And then I'd like to appoint a work group and um, withdraw these changes from what we send up to the commission if the board agrees, because I don't want to rush them and miss something else. I'd like to put more thought. We have a lot of substantive, st substantive changes we're talking about. Right, and so I just want to make sure that everybody on the board understands um, what your options are here. Okay, so um, we might be putting the card a little bit ahead of the horse, but since you've already raised it, I'll go ahead and address it. The options here are to, from my perspective, are to, are to do one of two things. To withdraw, as Madam Chair is talking about, and go to a work group to hash this stuff out. Um, to pass as written knowing that there's problems, which I think I'm hearing is not really an option. Um, and that's, that's really all we have, because in order to make the changes that, uh, and, and first of all, to fully discuss these issues, I think a worth group is warranted, and then we're going to have to republish, because we're going to have to redraft. Um, we're also going to have to do a new fiscal note on this. So it, it probably is in the best interest to withdraw it, but I'd like to go through the okay. entire thing yes. and then have the board discuss that okay. um, and that's ultimately your decision um, we've talked about three sorry we've talked about 86.7053 um, what about a and b what are, the, are their did concerns? we finish everything on two? Oh, sorry but I'm that. not sure we had um, the written notice the all residents and then repairs are improved. We had like three issues on that item. Mm -hmm. Was there anything else on that item? And the comments on repair and improvement are that it's too restrictive, correct? Yes. And if I may, uh, on the written notice, you know, I, I, I'm assuming, uh, at least from our the multifamily perspective, you know, we have 
sometimes provisions in our leases that qualify if electronic email or text communication mm -hmm. uh, is substantial for written notice of things like this. Okay. Um, so that might be something we could address in the, in the working group as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And on three, I think we kind of discussed that yeah, we already. We talked about that. Um, Maybe we're looking, leaning towards 72 hours. 72 hours. Um, a and B and three. I don't have any comments in front of me on A and B. Um, does the board have anything they'd like to say about that? Nothing on A or B? No. Okay. okay. Uh, C and D. Let me just look and make sure I don't have. I don't have any comments on C or D. Um, does the board have any concerns that you'd like to discuss on C or D? No? Uh, on E, we do have a comment from TAA. Uh, let me see. Let me find that. And E reads, the location at the same parking facility to which the vehicle will be moved. But that actually may flow into this discussion of, that we have just talked about of you all maybe having it moved elsewhere besides the parking facility. Because there's not room on the parking facility for these events. Is that what I'm understanding you all to be saying? No, it would it, to to be a relocate. It would have to be on the same, same parking, parking facility, facility by definition. Mm -hmm. But they may not know which location on the parking facility at the time of the movement is the issue. I yeah. Madam Chair, I would agree with that. Um, occasionally, we'll, we'll see that uh, a vendor has been hired to provide this service, and so the intent is to have the vehicles relocated to another area which is no longer accessible or it's full. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no more capacity for parking in that area. The proposed um, language, and I'll just, just to get it in the record, something we can discuss in, in the work group, but the proposed change to the language is the location at the same parking facility to which the vehicle will be moved or if not known at the time notice is given how residents will be notified about the location to which the vehicle was moved. Yeah. Um, so we do have some proposed language um, for E, which can certainly be talked about in a work group. Just wanted to make sure that I got TAA's uh, suggested language on that in the record. Uh, are, are there any further comments about E? Okay, moving on to F. I do not believe that I have uh, comments <coughs> particularly to F. Was seventy five percent in statute? Is that worth it? Not to exceed seventy five percent. No. No. That's not in statute. That's not in statute, but that mirrors um, the university the rules. university towing. Yeah. Are you good with that, Jeanette? Or did I just wondered <coughs> where it came from. Yeah, it wasn't something that we just came up with. We wanted to mirror what was being doing being done by the university. Okay. Um, G, does anybody have any issues or concerns <coughs> to discuss on that? <coughs> and for the record, that reads, a telephone number for contacting the parking facility owner or authorized agent to enable a person to recover a vehicle which has been relocated under this section. No? Okay. Moving on to four. I do not have any specific comments related to four, which reads, except when repairs or improvements are immediate and unforeseeable, or as authorized by a peace officer, a vehicle may not be towed and relocated within a parking facility or on a parking facility property without actual written notice to every affected resident as mandated in this section. I think you guys will have some comments on that. Just, it should be a <laughs> vehicle owner operator instead of resident mainly. This is something to talk about in the work group, but um, are you all having an issue with the narrowing, the narrow language of repair or improvements here, or is this okay because it speaks particularly to that issue? Would there be another emergency situation other than repairs and improvements that we need to address? An emergency event? A structure car. <laughs> 
Well, it could be like, um, yeah, it could be a public okay. safety, okay. yeah, a crime so scene, that might be too a narrow. fire, maybe use the hurricane. word incident. I'm sorry. Use the word incident. That's un unforeseeable. Yeah. yeah. I think unforeseeable incident is too broad, but in the work group we can certainly come up with uh, that would be a starting point. Okay, um, five says, if due to an immediate and unforeseeable need to make repairs or improvements, it is not possible to give 10 calendar days written notice. Each affected resident shall receive written notice as soon as the need for repairs or improvements is known. If it's an emergency, you're not gonna really be able to give them written notice, I don't think. I mean, you could have an immediate emergency or you could have an unforeseen repair that's three days. There may not be time in that situation for a written notice. I think I'll have to go back and look at the statute and make sure because it may be so limited that you're going to have to put some kind of notice. If you can do it by email, like Carl said, maybe so. But well, the problem is that the statute is is just kind of broad and doesn't doesn't speak to this issue. I don't notice. think. No notice. Mm -mm. Requirements. Mm -mm. I understand but we, can, we, we get in all kind of big old giant bills in Austin over this kind of stuff. So you better be careful in your deliberations of notifying some way. I think it's definitely a work group type of discussion yeah. because you run into so many different facets with yeah. this. If, if you're talking about giving written notice to the affected residents, then that would, I would suggest to the, um, especially if the apartment themselves are sitting out a notification and that would be to leaseholders because there's unauthorized <coughs> occupants, there's unauthorized residents. And so um, are they, is it their due diligence to be able to make sure that the, the unauthorized, it's mm -hmm. to the leaseholder. However, the towing industry, if we are going to relocate or remove or tow, then it needs to be to the vehicle owner or mm -hmm. operator. Mm -hmm. So I think it needs to go into work group. Is that going to be a regular mail or certified mail because they're not going to get certified mail within yeah. that short period of time, even 72 hours. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen, so I don't know. Well, That's don't gonna be it's a not going to be 72 hours if it's immediate and mm -hmm. unforeseeable. Mm -hmm. It could be five hours. And then or uh, two adding, minutes, Yeah, yes. if it's a fire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, that, that may be where you go down to eight, a peace officer is authorized to direct the relocation. That may be where mm -hmm. you have to go on this. Mm -hmm. You need a lot of research. Because it's public need, safety. You, that's the only time you're going to have that kind of a need to move. So, because you just really can, you start, we'll end up with the whole load of rules again, and you won't be able to even do what the statute intended if you try to nitpick every single instant that you can yeah. think of. Okay, on, on, are we done talking about six? I don't think we talked about six yet. We did five. Yes, you're right. Uh, six, are we done talking about five? Yes. yes. Six reads, the owner or operator of any authorized vehicle which is towed from one location on a parking facility to another location on the parking facility without 10 days written notice may not be charged for the tow. I know you have a comment on that. <laughs> I do. Well, the, the, a decision hasn't been made if we're going to stick with the 10 days written, so we can't follow through with anything because the def defining the number of days Good point. hasn't been confirmed. Yet. How about you say without applicable notice or appropriate notice? That makes more sense. Yeah. That way you're going to open it up to, yeah. it'll, it'll accept any notice that, that you approve. I think we'll have to talk about that from the enforcement standpoint of how they would even enforce something like that. We, we, you get into a broad term like any applicable notice, that could be, you could, you could get somebody arguing that that's pretty much anything from screaming across a parking lot to <laughs> sending you a letter. Well, it would be we something that's already written and that's already agreed to above that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, and Good the point. other 
The other concern is if the owner or operator of the vehicle um, may not be charged for the tow. I, I kind of go back to if you, uh, if, a, if a towing company is being directed by a peace officer or the property representative or owner to relocate the vehicle, and it's within notices have been sent and such. When we're on the scene, we're not collecting payment from the vehicle owner or operator. Mm -hmm. So. Um, well, you never collect right. from the vehicle owner. So then to then you further from say, the property owner. right, that okay. the vehicle so owner operator may not be charged for the tow, that's implying that we would be able to collect from <laughs> the vehicle yeah. owner operator yeah. anyway. Okay. We have no way to collect from them. Yeah. I, yeah. So no, I understand that. It's okay. Um, are we ready to move to seven? I'll read it into the record. The towing company and tow truck operator performing the relocation of vehicles within a parking facility are responsible for creating and maintaining a tow ticket for each vehicle relocated under this section as required by law. In addition to 86.705G and 86.709, the tow ticket shall state the name of the individual who authorized the vehicle's relocation and the date when the parking facility or authorized agent gave notice to the owner or operator of each vehicle relocated. comments does that need to add in the word owner in the last line parking facility owner or authorized agent I mean mm. so if you're looking at it grammatically <laughs> the, okay. I guess the facility <clears throat> itself okay. is not person. <coughs> okay. can we move on to eight eight reads a peace officer is authorized to direct the relocation of a vehicle from one location within a parking facility to another location within the parking <coughs> facility to further public safety are there any comments on that one what is the purpose of that is that something that they're not allowed to do now i think it's to clarify it's sort of mirroring the statute the presence of the peace officer that it's not just the parking facility owners that the peace officer can do this um, and, and I, I believe the thinking on this was the peace officer would really only be doing this in instances of public safety. You have a critical incident that needs mm -hmm. to be moved. Yeah. Uh, Mary Winston, TDLR. Um, also, because it, it specifically states from one location within the parking facility to another location within the parking facility, so not a random location mm -hmm. um, within a. Here comes Todd. Well, to here comes Todd. <laughs> I'd also like to point out that this would be an incident management tow and not a private property tow anymore if a peace officer is present. It could be unless they're like a security guard for that apartment complex and they're not acting in their official capacity. They're not the scene of an accident or an incident. Um, what those are there to address is if you go to 85705 as it currently is, there's two places the vehicle can go. Uh, a vehicle storage facility that's licensed under 2303 or a place agreed upon by the owner. They're adding those things back in there because the, the end of the rules to say, hey, they, it can now go be relocated. The vehicle can now be relocated. And it's doing that for the parking facility owner. It's doing it for if law enforcement directs it because the towing company is who we're concerned about. What we don't want to have happen is them to get in a scenario where they're being told to relocate it, but by rule or statute, they're not allowed to. So that's why those are being added back into the rules to kind of clarify, even if law enforcement says, the towing company, you're going to be okay. 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 Gotcha. Does that make sense? So I know it sounds redundant, but there is a reason for it. No clarification. Right. It's always good to know the reason behind the right. yeah. language. Okay. All right. Um, okay. What do y'all think? Well, let's finish talking about the rules, and then you, you guys can deliberate on how you'd like to proceed with the rules. Um, I believe we're finished talking about 86 point, sorry, 705. Um, the next section where there are changes is 86.800 on fees. Uh, there was one comment that we received on that. And the comment was actually a question. Um, 
and the question was how does a VSFL and TO get a refund? The last five years has been expensive for all small businesses who have to pay higher fees. I, I will be real honest with you, I don't understand what a VSFL is. And Maybe I, vehicle storage facility, facility lot or license because that's what this okay. is. Yeah. Vehicle um, storage facility license and okay. tow operator. Um, but this is a question, not a comment related to the rules. This is a question for compliance, uh, and we'll get Todd to circle back to the commenter on that. Uh, the changes, um, I mentioned earlier that we were withdrawing the deletion of the rule related to the tow training license because it doesn't go into effect until next year. We also have to withdraw um, E on this section. Uh, the training license fee will still be $25 while the fee is in effect. We will strip out those two issues as we get closer to the effective date of that rule, which eliminates the tow training license. Um, the rest of the changes are the elimination um, of the dual vehicle storage facility license and towing operator. Uh, we have done away with that, so we have deleted the original application fee, the expedited dual license fee, and the renewal. Are there any questions on 86.800? Madam Chair, I turn it over to you. Um, I, would, I would request permission to send uh, the applicable rules to the Commission for adoption. Um, it's up for discussion. You can decide how you would like to proceed. Discussion? Okay, so if it goes to work group, then it has to come back at our next meeting and be reviewed and approved. Let me clarify. You can change, you can send all or some of the rules <coughs> to the commission. So you can, take out you, can you can you can withdraw what you would like to withdraw, and it would not affect the ones that are the rules that are okay with you, and that you see no problem with the commission adopting. So you don't. If you want to send something to a work group, it doesn't mean that all of this stays back. It can still go <coughs> forward. So what about a recap of the ones that we want to hold back and send to work group? We've got um, three potential to withdraw, and one is the 86.213, which is, I believe, to do with the training mm -hmm. license. That's right. That's the tow operator training license. 86.800E, capital E, that's training license related. Mm -hmm. And then the 86.705, the entire section. I think everything else the board seemed to be okay with. Am I right? Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what we would be looking at is a motion to send the rules as presented to commission with the exception of those three items, 86.213, mm -hmm. 86.705, and 86.800E. Yes. So do we want to have, is there any discussion or comments or motions? I can make the motion if we have no, no problems with that. I don't think there's any discussion. Okay, okay so then so to withdraw 86.2.13, 86.705, 86.800E. Withdraw those. All other rules go to the commission for approval. Is that right? Recommending Do I have adoption a, by the commission? Yeah, yeah that's what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> Do I have a second for Amy's motion? Aye, Tasha Moore, a second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Very good. Madam Chair, would you like to um, would you like to um, have any discussion related to the work group? Yes, I'm I'm ready to appoint a work group, and um, let me know if you're not willing to serve on this work group. I'm like Tasha, and Kyle, and Amy, to and and myself. I'll participate. Is that good with everybody? Okay. Okay. Then. Um, we will have myself, Tasha, Kyle, and Amy. I believe you need to make a motion. Do you have a motion? I'll mo Go ahead. Don't I'll, I'll make a motion. Kyle, Jackson. Okay. Second. <coughs> I'll second Amy Milston. Okay, we need some, some motions on the right hand side. <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling like very quiet on this side. <laughs> oh, I feel like I've got all of them. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Very good. We've got some work to do. And I think that wraps up the rules discussion. Yeah. Yeah.
Good job. Thank you for your patience. Thanks, Elizabeth. <laughs> and Todd <laughs> and everybody who worked. I know yeah. we had a lot yeah. of people working on these. We did. We had, we had a lot of staff from enforcement that helped us, as I said at the last meeting. It's a collaborative effort at TDLR, and we thank all of them if they're watching for, their, do a great for their contributions. Y'all do a great job. Getting stuff done. So we'll work on it some more. And our next item is uh, discussion regarding its I, item I, or discussion <coughs> regarding the legislative intent of 2308.00211H. That's our car hauler yes. issue. Yes. Elizabeth Salinas, Strip Matter, again from the General Counsel's Office. <laughs> uh, at last meeting, just to give some background, at the last meeting we um, spoke about the definition uh, in tow um, of a tow truck as it related to car haulers involved in pre-shipping transactions, pre-arranged shipping transactions, excuse me. And I was asked to look into whether there was any legislative intent to somehow <laughs> define the term car hauler. Um, so what I did was I went back into the Texas legislature online and specifically looked into that, the particular bill related to that uh, statutory change, and, and it is completely silent. There is no discussion in the legislative record of car hauler. There's no discussion of what it might mean, what it does mean, what it doesn't mean. Um, and so that being said, uh, TDLR, um, reiterates that its position is on this, that in the absence of any definition to the contrary, we look at a car hauler not by what it looks like, but, what, but by its function. And um, I can allow Todd to take any further questions on that. If all it does is move vehicles as cargo in course of a pre-arranged shipping transaction is the key. That's all it does. Any questions or comment on that? <laughs> so, as we talked about last time, in the absence of any, any direction in the statute, um, that is our interpretation. If, if, if you, if, and I understand there are concerns in the industry about that interpretation, but that is the interpretation of the agency. So your next step would be um, to seek clarification in the legislature during the next session. What, TDLR is, it can't just make up a definition. Of, of a car hauler and I believe that prior to, to me coming on board the previous AGC had uh, Charles Johnson had numerous conversations with the board on that subject. Can you repeat what you said Todd? I want, I want to make sure I get that exactly right. <laughs> if, if they only move vehicles as cargo it's part of a pre-arranged shipping transaction. A car hauler that solely uses that solely moves vehicles as cargo as part of a pre-arranged shipping transaction it is not defined as a uh, tow truck and there are FAQs now that reflect this. Okay, we are going to get FAQs specifically mm -hmm. to address this. I believe you looked at them. Well, I, I didn't know. I right. didn't know if they were they, okay or not. Are they out there? Were they published? They're published. Probably. And um, they're published. Yes, they yes. are published. Okay. They're out there, and we just this agenda item discussion of legislative intent is a little narrow, and you know we have to notice yeah. um, everything that we discussed today, so. Apparently, Elizabeth did the research. There is none. <laughs> so we've answered that. Uh, we may be moving forward with other work groups and discussions, but we just can't go too deeply okay. into the I discussion. Got to and I've got to announce myself, Mary Winston. Okay. Anybody have a question on the legislative intent or comment? <laughs> you question, but there's nothing. Okay. Thank you for yeah, checking on that. Yeah. And I guess we're ready for the next item, item J. Discussion and possible appointment of work group to evaluate environmental hazard fee. And uh, I'm going to let Jeanette talk about this. She did some work on this in the interim. Well, I have, and uh, you have in your packet the approach that I've taken because I did look at states and local governments and how they handle abandoned vehicles. And there's no question that vehicles that we end up with or fall within that category and have all of the issues that communities are concerned about whenever we're just trying to dispose of them. And, you know, that is part of trying to remediate our property, which is an action in order to uh, reverse or address an environmental issue on your property, which would also include the cleanup of property, as far as you know, what we do every day of 
you know, the hundreds of pictures I have now of parks laying on the ground, you know, fluid sets everywhere, that kind of thing. So I think that we've got a much better handle because the information that I went and seeked from, and I picked 10 vehicle storage facilities, everyone's rates are regulated because it's non-consent toast. And so everybody's rates the same. The percentage of vehicles that they auction, they know what percentage of vehicles they auction. They know how many vehicles they auction. They know how many vehicles they receive. So you can get some financial information very specific for the industry across the whole because we really struggled with that trying to uh, come up with something that was based solely on good housekeeping. This is based on a broader perspective and I think that the information is out there and available that we can get and show what the fees should be. And again, I wrote up what I felt like after I did a lot of, of study and also the information that I received from the vehicle storage facilities. Uh, I probably got about 20 responses that were good and so I can continue to move forward on that and, and bring the information forward to the advisory board and work in the work group first. So we're ready to do that finally after all this time. Thank you for that, Ms. Rash. Uh, Elizabeth Helena Strittmatter, again with the General Counsel's Office. I, I would just like to read the um, statute that we are, or the portion of the statute that we're talking about here. Um, 2303.155B5, or 3B5, says, a fee and an amount set by the commission for the rem remediation, recovery, or capture of an environmental or biological hazard. Mm -hmm. We have carefully reviewed the information that Ms. Rash has, has sent in to us, and a couple of comments that we have is, that the, the we think the data is incomplete. What, what we need in order to move forward on actually looking at setting a fee is we need to have data related to the actual remediation itself. How, when is it occurring, under what circumstances is it occurring, who is doing the cleanup, and what does that cleanup cost? Um, because what was submitted to us and what you have in your materials are calculations of, of monies lost based on auctions. That doesn't get us where we need to be in terms of justifying an environmental fee to all consumers who have to get their vehicle out of a VSF. So we need additional data that would allow us to actually look at whether there, there is ongoing um, problems or, or issues and whether this is even something that's occurring. Um, out there that there are, because in order, in order for this fee to, <coughs> to exist, in order for this fee to be applicable, you have to have the remediation, recovery, or capture of an environmental or biological hazard. Not everything can be an environmental or biological hazard because if everything is, then nothing is. So what we need to look at is, are there environmental or biological hazards out there? And in those instances, what are those hazards? How are they being cleaned up? And what are the costs of those um, cleanups? That is the data that we're going to need in order to be able to look at whether or not we can assess a fee and what amount that fee would be. It has to be based on the actual costs that are being incurred for the remediation, the recovery, or the capture of a hazard. And I want to just say something for all the new members here that haven't been through these discussions. Um, this fee was authorized by the legislature in 07. 2007, 11 years ago, and we have had numerous work groups on it and numerous discussions. It's been our, on our agenda many times. The issue is that there's, <clears throat> for TDLR to set a rate, they have to have some data. We've been unable to get good data from our tow companies on what their costs are for environmental cleanup or even what the definition is because like to the, the tow companies, it's cleaning up the junk that people throw out of their cars. You know, that's a hazard to our property. But to TDLR and the legal community, that is not 
an environmental hazard. So that is our struggle that we've been going through for many years in trying to set something. Uh, so far, we're still, I don't think we've made any progress. We still don't have any firm data or definitions. I beg to differ here. And I completely beg to differ because it does cost us to get rid of these junk vehicles. And we are trying to reverse and stop the environmental damage that's being done to our facility because we have to get rid of these vehicles. And we have stored them and we have, have the cost along with all the other costs that you talk about. And my intent today was to start a work group and look at the whole situation, including what the chairman just said. Because every day we clean up our facilities. <laughs> now, do we do a good job? We know we don't. We couldn't even get a tow rate fee because we had, what, had so few people that sent mm -hmm. their data. That's not what these small, small businesses do they don't know how to do things like big, big business does so it's been a struggle to get them all on the same page this gets us some data that they all have because they have to go through the auction process in order to get rid and dispose of these vehicles that nobody wants so that was just the way for us to get started because I have started gathering the cost <coughs> for cleanup, which takes someone to go out and look. It costs labor to clean every day. We know that. We do that. And we've not been compensated for that, even though the statute said the department was to set something back in 2007, a fee. So we've started that process. And Madam Chairman, we need to go to work group and get this I done. And I don't think anybody disagrees with what you're saying as far as the cost and the cleanup. It's just that TDLR has told us they need more in order to justify a fee to keep the fee from being struck down. Uh, Mary we Winston, a fee. TDLR. Um, Madam Chairwoman, we have had this discussion well before I got here. <laughs> um, Jeanette, you're saying that you have, this is a start. Correct. And this is completely based on the abandoned vehicle model, right? Correct. Okay. Recouping we, we that We never abandoned. thought about including that before because, you know, and like I said in the paper that I wrote up, it hit me because I'm trying to get rid of all these water-loaded hazardous, and I'm like, Oh my gosh, all these abandoned vehicles are health hazards. And so this okay. is one measure of an environmental it cost, is. right? So, yes. are, and you are saying that there are other measures yes. of, and you are seeking to get that information yes. on the other measures. Okay, we've danced this dance, or you guys, some of you have danced this dance a couple of times. If some of you do not mind dancing the dance again, uh, understanding that Jeanette has volunteered to get this information, we can do that if that's okay with you, Madam Chair. Um, Led, uh, it's not been successful in the past, but we have new <coughs> people, new opportunities. I see a couple of nodding heads. New blood. <laughs> if you, new blood. If, if, if a work group does not mind volunteering for that, um, I don't know where it'll end up, but I don't want, uh, you know, Jeanette says we're just starting. We understand that this is not the only measure. Abandoned vehicles right. has become the measure because of Harvey. Right. Okay, so right. that, but there are, there's no definition um, of uh, environmental waste to a certain degree. We don't have a definition. <clears throat> but if we can flesh this out, maybe we won't get to the end of the answer or the, but maybe we'll get closer. Does if it's up to you, Madam Chair, if someone would like to, obviously, Ms. Rash wants to lead that group. Definitely. If um, we have some more people and that can kind of get with her with that, uh -huh. that is okay, I uh -huh. think, for us to discuss. Do we have volunteers? Amy? James? James would be good. The insurance. We have the insurance perspective. Uh, anybody else? I'll volunteer. 
Okay. Okay. We have so we have a lot Thomas, of new blood for this. James, Amy, and Jeanette, and maybe with our two new board members, we'll have some fresh ideas and approaches. And Jeanette, as as we were discussing this, we, we understand the, the broad approach you're trying to get. The problem that, that we kind of ran into is the statute gives us a narrow approach, you know, for, for the remediation, the capture remediation of, of those biological and environmental hazards. But I think if we keep going, I think we might be able to get there. Look up the definition of remediation. Yeah, well, yeah. But it's, and this it's fits a, into that definition. So I did look at it. I know, I know about statue. I understand that. And, and I actually printed it and sent it to all the BSFs, and I said, look, this, it has to fit within this definition. And, and I, I understand that, but for what they use to clean up, that would help us. That information, what they, yes. what they I'm use. Yeah, I've already started gathering and, that. Right. And, and that, that is, is what we're saying. Someone in the audience that is who we does had it. Had we right. got yeah. people listening. Mary Winston, yeah. if you have any data, <coughs> yes. Yes. To Jeanette, yes, we need data the more on the better. actual and environmental cleanup and of the BSF lot, not yes. a wreck, right. BSF lot. This is what I'm hearing, Mary Winston, this is what I'm hearing Jeanette say, that she has 20 people, uh, our companies okay. that have, are beginning to give her information. Yep. She yes. is specifically asking for costs right. of that cleanup or remediation, right. and so, we can now table this if it's up to you, Ms. Madam Chairman, to get to the work group to get that information and get it going. Yep. So, yeah, if, if, if this is a start and it appears to be a start and Ms. Rash has, is in contact and they're going to get her that information, that's what we need is that actual cost. To yes. We understand the loss. We do. Yes. So we, we, know we have a work group appointed. So when you get your data, Jeanette, you want to meet them? When, yes. when, you, when you obtain your data, let me know and we can work on scheduling the work group. And get, and well, it, it may be best for the work group to, to meet and define the data. I agree. I agree. Yeah. And okay. then you go collect the data, then, then you okay. come back. I agree. Because right. just collecting a bunch of data without definitions, it, it can be, That's a fair point, it, it can yeah. set you back in your, in your project. Good point. James. And you have all this new blood yeah. and they may have some new ideas on how yeah. to get this data. And sources. Yeah. 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 Madam Chair, I, I, um, I just need a little direction. So although I'm not currently at, on the work group, but I have some, all, some suggestions on information, would that mean that I should join the work group on that? You can give those now. All right. I, I, I just want to make sure that I state and out loud. Let me just say something real quick. I'm sorry. For the sure. new people, the, the point of having work groups is that so we can meet without a quorum. Okay. And that's why anything, yes. your suggestions would be good to give out in the public meeting environment, mm -hmm. because if you join the quorum, you that's don't right. want to mess up our that's quorum. Right. Yeah. And that's the reason yes. we have work groups, so we can discuss things without violating the public meeting act. So. Thank you. I so, appreciate it. Just yeah. so everybody understands Anything that. you have, just let me know. Just send it to me. Okay. Well, I, I just know that I've heard in the past where it's been difficult or um, TDLR has been unable to get good data from the industry. And I've voiced this in the past. I think that very probably what may be the case in some of the smaller businesses is we haven't had the luxury to separate those expenses. Right. We had to That's absorb right. them. That's right. And so now we're being asked to define and separate. So we're, we're right. I, I can understand. And I don't... Right necessarily agree that the, da the data, um, the industry did not want to provide it, just possibly how, just knowing what the definitions are, what is a definition of cleanup, define environmental hazards, biological hazards, remediation, and, and what are those measures? And so if, if we kind of try to go out there and, and help the industry with the definitions of these, that way they can begin to extract <laughs> it from their operations, their costs. Well, and that's what happened, Tasha. Whenever I started trying to get these numbers together, I made several attempts. I've been working on this about, what, six months now. And, you know, separating when I couldn't during the Harvey period, but I would send information, you know, I'd send a request out and I would see what I'd get back and I'm like, okay, this doesn't work. And then I have to turn around and they got tired of getting faxes and emails from me, like Dana, send them again, send them again, because I'd have to go back and be very specific an explanation of what I'm asking because it's kind of like the car hauler situation. You know, what I think it is may not be what it is to someone else, and you're absolutely <coughs> right because they're having to do this job right now. They just don't separate it out. 
because they haven't had it separated out and it's a necessity that they have to deal with every day and so it, it's a learning process and I've learned a lot so I think I can really nail this this time I do that's Mary Winston I think that's I think that's great um, Todd uh, is going to work with with you guys okay. with the work group and we, we have some insurance on board good so we yeah we've already handled the situation with, with the body shop industry okay so it's um, you just look at invoices take a look at the invoices that you're paying those folks that come in and take away your your hazardous waste right. divided by the number of vehicles that go in because right. hazardous waste is both generated and cleaned up by body shop and then right. you divide it by the number of vehicles that's what that's how much you charge and you move on and okay. you do a cost plus scenario well, it's right. it's really simple well thank you mr awesome. sears and okay. we're going to see how much that can uh, apply in in um this industry and uh, that's great so todd you ready to hop on it yeah yes jeremy Christmas. clark i would i would throw out to the work group um, as far as seeking definition uh, while it's my understanding from general counsel this the uh, legislature hasn't necessarily defined it on this side of the spectrum uh, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality TCEQ they've got definitions like this that the legislature has defined clearly already yeah. I would entertain sure reviewing those for if I can just c comment on that um, we actually looked for the TCEQ definitions and there aren't any specific to this they they talk about industrial waste and common household waste okay kind of the same thing but just differently worded right and I, I reached out to TCEQ whenever we were discussing this previously right. and talked right. extensively with them and right. and there's there's a lot that kind of goes into that of, of okay. which one it falls under and that's why it's hard for the industry to get a handle on absolutely that's right and we actually even also looked at the EPA definitions to see if we could try to get some federal definitions <coughs> And the EPA definitions are beyond confusing. <coughs> if this, then that, but not this, but this, yeah. and and so I think what we're needing is just some common sense approach to it. Um, you know, we can certainly try to look at TCEQ again. I don't know when your last contact with them was. A long ago. Yeah, uh, we can certainly go back and, and go down that avenue again. But just looking on their materials on their website, we we did that earlier this week, and we didn't see. What would have been helpful and, and that's confusing for an attorney yeah so. and, and and you know when, when we take a look at those that go to auction I don't know if value is the way to look at it um, gross vehicle weight um, it's defined by every car and that right. may be another way to, to do this percentage of gross vehicle weight and then charge by the the, the, the size of the car not the value because you have a very large car that generates quite a bit but nets you a low value and vice versa. Um, and all we um, need is data. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes. Work group. Another, yeah. Yeah, gonna, okay. another Work venue on. for definition resource you may entertain, and this is based on my, my public safety experience and the w past work history, it would be um, some of the railroads, mm. uh, Northern Pacific, you know, some of those guys, they have entire divisions that deal with environmental cleanup and remediation deal to railroad activities. And since they do oh, yeah. haul a large amount of vehicle via rail car, there's a very good chance that they have a definition in place that may be workable to fit our need. Jeanette, don't you love this this new blood? <laughs> yes, I do. I okay. do. I'm telling you. Okay. We're going to get it done. I, I believe that. Now, um, and that's going to move us, Mary Winston, to the recommendations for agenda items for next board meeting. Okay. With those recommendations, um, we have a couple of work groups that need to meet a couple of times. Uh, before we can get what their findings or even preliminary findings on the agenda we're heading into holiday season I just gave Todd a couple of extra Christmas presents um, <laughs> of work to, to begin um, I think I was just chatting with Tamala we're moving I'm thinking towards March so work groups can actually have time you know, I'm not sure what this holiday season is going to look like work-wise and then holiday-wise, and then so we're, we're then at the new year. So 
we, you know, we, the work groups do meet via and phone. We're not email. looking at any hard deadlines other than we want to get these relocate <coughs> rules done and we want to get this fee done. But yeah, I mean, we don't have any hard deadlines, so right? Is, <coughs> no, is March looking good? Do we have some dates in March? Oh, sorry. We have the first, we have February 27th, March 1st, March 7th. <coughs> Uh, 27th, Tuesday. Tuesday. <coughs> March 1st is Thursday. March 7th is a Wednesday. Now, clarification, is this for work group meeting? That's This is for actual advisory. Advisory, advisory for us to come back. Okay. Did you say work March 1 or March 7th? Yes. Work group will have to meet before the, this. Yeah, it's on the 27th. This kind of gives the timeline for yeah. work groups you need to you know, meet and any preference or anybody not um, available? I like things? March uh, 7. <coughs> That's fine with me. Seven. Okay. March 7, good with everybody to get on your calendar? Yeah. Okay. Let's go with that. And then, uh, you know, these work groups may need to meet more than once, so <laughs> I wouldn't delay the meetings too long. But um, if they could all meet by sometime in January, well, during January, of those. Oh, okay. but nearly all of us are closed, so. And we can do these by phone, Jimmy. right? So you don't have to yes. travel. Put Jimmy on call. So that helps a lot. He's the insurance guy. I think he's here. Mm -hmm. um, so we have the the date of our next meeting. We have two agenda items. Is that all we have so far? So far. Uh, those are a couple of humdingers. <laughs> <laughs> so, and of as always, if more There'll agenda be other items, just contact us. Madam Chair, we were going to revisit the VSFO 11 in its form and shape at some yes, point. Yes, that was um, from the last that. meeting. We need yeah. to get that on the next okay. agenda because we're we were going to add, we talked about adding the location the car was taken to. Right. And right. we thought that would be a very good thing, okay. a very helpful item to have on there. And the so phone we, numbers for the people to call to find their car. Okay. And also TDLR's complaint information like we put on all our stuff. So yeah, we could do that at the same time and get that done. Can, uh, can we assign that to Todd too? <laughs> Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. <laughs> Wake up, Todd. You're really good now. The VSF 11 form, we talked about at our last meeting about adding a few things to be helpful, such as the location the vehicle is being towed to, the phone number where someone, the vehicle owner can call to locate it, and the TDLR complaint information. No. <laughs> so we'll add Madam discussion <coughs> form 11, VSF form 11. But if we could, um, if you could just redesign that form and have it for us at our next meeting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Madam Chair, I, I, if I could add Tasha Mora, um, my notes from the last meeting, although I was sitting on that side of this table, was exactly how you had said to add contact info for the consumer to call and learn more of the status or location yeah. or movement of the vehicle. Um, a form with either the TLR and the TDI information on it. Yes. Um, right. Let's see. Assign. Let's see. Talk about. And I, there is some notes that I cannot read, but I think <laughs> one of the part, one of the key things was, not only the TDLR information, but the TDI information. Yeah. Okay. And this would be <clears throat> given to the vehicle owner if they have an issue. You give them a copy of this, so they would have that. Okay. Yes. They'd get a copy of. It. And I just um, had another thought on the car hauler issue. Is that something we could get an AG opinion on? Definition? Be careful what you ask for. I know. That's what I'm. I, well, that's what I would say. Uh, you may get an opinion that. <laughs> 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 yes, 
Yes. If I may, Jeremy Clark, just for clarification, <clears throat> but um, from what I can gather, unless I misinterpreted something from Todd's discussion on it as well, uh, this is simply just defining a car hauler while it is uh, basically for business, not for private use, correct? Uh, pre range shipping transition. Yeah, so that would be for business. Form. So, I mean, that seems pretty easy if they're using it to conduct mm -hmm. business for profit. One would think. It's way more. Are we going to back? Are we backtracking up the agenda, or are we? We're still talking about the. Oh, for the. Oh, yes. yeah. It's, I'm sorry. We're kind of, but it's on our agenda, so. It is. Uh, it's the interpretation, legislative intent, though. Okay. So we may be going off a little bit, but that's a good question for Todd after the meeting. Yeah, maybe. after the meeting. <laughs> Cause I, yeah, I didn't hear it, so. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I'm not paying attention. Okay. So do you see how the open meeting training kind of flows in here? <laughs> Every once in a while. <laughs> I just need to ask the question to make sure I understood where we were at yes. for it coming up for the next okay. agenda item. That was my primary for my personal clarification, not to try to conduct business. Okay. My apologies. Okay. Are we good with him asking his question? or? Oh, no, we're good with asking the question. We are moving forward um, with what we're going to put on the next uh, agenda. Um, I just, if we were backtracking, we just needed to call out that we have gone back to agenda item okay. I um, or H or whatever it would be uh, for further clarification. And if we want something put on the next agenda and worded in a different way, if we want to capture more information, let us know. Okay. We'll work on those captions. We'll get that uh, to where it's properly noticed. And uh, so we can further that, that discussion. I have no idea what's happening. You're going <laughs> to clarify what we're talking about? I'm sorry, ma'am. You had a question to clarify what we're talking <coughs> about for the future agenda? Yes. Just to, and I can, I can pose that now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the question being was, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're, we're hung up on the de definition of car hauler. Uh, for this part of being that it this is basically f defining it as for profit as in they're in they're conducting business for profit using this type of apparatus they, they are engaged in, in commercial enterprise yes yeah commercial enterprise right. thank you I, for some reason that was escaping me mm -hmm. okay. yeah okay okay very good thank you ma'am uh -huh. anything else for the next agenda uh, Tasha Mora um, I, I would like guidance on our it sounds like the agenda is going to be pretty lengthy and hefty um, okay. especially because it's to be open for additions if I'm um, being in the industry I have a concern that I, I want us to be able to eventually discuss and potentially have some legislature behind it I'm not too sure I'm kind of navigating these waters would it be appropriate for me to mention it now that I would like to open that for further discussion at meetings, or how does that work? It's yeah, you're, we're looking at future agenda items, okay. and it may fit into the next agenda. And he, here at TDLR, we're here. This is yep. a regular work day, so whatever we're called in to do, we do. You guys do the heavy lifting. Okay. So those agendas that are packed, we're here, but. This board is, is who's doing that heavy lifting. So yes, let's just bring it up to your fellow board members. And The, the concern that I have or the, what I'd like to have um, us discuss is um, as a non-consent tow provider, specifically private property towing, um, we have found ourselves and many other companies have voiced that they have found themselves in a position where a vehicle is loaded to a tow truck and an individual gets into that loaded vehicle. And at that point, even when we call the peace officer or law enforcement, both the peace officer and the tow company are at a standstill, essentially, because this is a civil issue. And there's, at that moment, no criminal violation that's occurring except for potentially fining our driver for hindering an, ex an entrance or exit. So. There's a lot of, it's multifaceted because then I would, I would tactfully um, disagree because our driver would be able to enter his vehicle and move a loaded vehicle, but cannot when there's an individual in there. So who is actually causing that um, um, hindrance? 
But secondly is creating, um, making it a criminal violation to enter a loaded t tow truck, a vehicle that's loaded onto a tr tow truck, regardless of what stage that vehicle is loaded. Otherwise, there's nothing that the peace officers are able to do with that individual. They can't force the individual out of the vehicle and then you're, you're standing there and you could sit there for 45 minutes while this escalates. Um, the issue is there have been consumers that have been hurt. There have been tow drivers that have been hurt. There have been people whose lives have been lost or severely injured because of these circumstances. Not to mention the damage that can occur with the equipment when they just pull their park into reverse and just drive off or attempt to drive off of our equipment. Okay. Um, is this so, something that, uh, it's not off a, is this I a TDLR issue? That. No, I, I think that you're, you're talking about criminal penalties that's outside of the official business that, that the board has purview over. Um, that's okay. not something that we, that we as an agency can address. It's going to be productive because they can't really help us with that. Okay. Because I was even, I was even uh, went into discussions with this with a peace officer, a uh, higher ranking that that was also at a loss and said we're not too that, sure. That's definitely an issue where I would say um, that would be something that you need to speak with your association and with the legislature about because you're talking about a change in the penal code, okay. um, and that's not something that TDR has any purview over or that the board has any purview over. Okay. But certainly, if that's an issue, you're welcome to address that through other avenues. At least those who are listening and understand it, mm -hmm. those in the industry um, yeah. recognize it. It's, a, it's an mm -hmm. issue. It's a challenge we're faced with every day. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Do you have any more notes? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that's good. That's Welcome good. to the group. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what we, we need, this um, fresh input. Anybody else have anything for the next agenda? It's not, there's no deadline here. You know, we can add it later, so. Yeah. Very good. Well, there being no further business, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Of course, I'll make that motion. <laughs> Jimmy Spears will second. Okay. Again, from the left here. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> We're adjourned. <laughs>